Chyba wam wystarczy już tej melodyjki, co? Dzień dobry wszystkim, witam bardzo serdecznie na live'ie, na premierze książki Po prostu kupuj, polskiego wydania książki. Jest tu ze mną Nick, już tutaj w tle się szykuje, także wpuszczam go na scenę i zaczynamy powolutku. Hello Nick, how are you? How you doing? Uh, dobry wieczór, dobry wieczór. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, I'm practicing. I have, a, I have a few phrases I'm going to pull out throughout the, throughout the night. So. <laughs> <laughs> Dokładnie. Uczyłem Nika e, troszeczkę, e, że tak powiem, po polsku, żeby tutaj się do Was również po polsku odzywał. Także widzimy, że nauka nie poszła w las. E, witam Was bardzo serdecznie. Słuchajcie, będziemy zaczynali. E, myślę, że najprościej będzie po prostu, jeżeli e, m, na dzień dobry e, odtworzę Wam e, m, tą rozmowę, którą już z Nikiem nagraliśmy. To jest nasze spotkanie autorskie, więc od tego dzisiaj zaczniemy, a później, to wam już pokazuję, a później przejdziemy do, przejdziemy do kolejnych części, czyli będziemy mieli po tej rozmowie również troszeczkę takich kulis związanych z książką, po prostu kupuj, z tym polskim wydaniem, z tym jak wyglądało podpisywanie, z tym jak wyglądały wysyłki dla, dla was, również z takimi ciemnymi stronami książki, czyli jak na przykład wyglądały najgorsze egzemplarze, które udało mi się odnaleźć i wyszukać. Dzisiaj świętujemy, więc generalnie dzisiaj jest dużo o książce, a nie tyle o tematyce książki, ale na końcu oczywiście, żeby stało się, że tak powiem, żeby ta uczta była pełna, to nikt będzie odpowiadał na wasze pytania dotyczące inwestowania również, a dotyczące również przedmiotu książki i ja również będę odpowiadał na wasze pytania. Także po prostu zaczynajmy. Zacznijmy od tego, że puszczę wam rozmowę, którą nagraliśmy z Nikiem. Ta rozmowa jest przygotowana w taki sposób, żeby każdy, kto chce ją zrozumieć, również w języku polskim, mógł się zapoznać z treścią po polsku po prostu, więc nie tylko po angielsku. My będziemy rozmawiać po angielsku, ale macie również podpisy, więc ta rozmowa została nagrana dosłownie tydzień temu. Nie znaliśmy jeszcze wtedy wyników przez sprzedaży, ale na koniec oczywiście w trakcie także wam pokażę wyniki przez sprzedaży książki po prostu kupuj bo jest się czym pochwalić po prostu. Dobrze. Nick, just info for you. We'll start uh, with our recording and then we'll get back to the next uh, part of the presentation. Yeah? OK, no to rzućmy to na ekran i jedziemy z koksem. Ta nasza rozmowa trwa około y, pół godziny, ale śmiało, że tak powiem, komentujcie na żywo. Ja również będę y, na te komentarze starał się w trakcie odpowiadać, bo też będę oglądał tą rozmowę, um, a później, że tak powiem, jeżeli będą jakieś pytania, to sobie je ogwiazdkuję i odpowiemy na nie na końcu. No to jedziemy z koksem, moi drodzy. How you doing? Perfect. And you? Doing great. <laughs> Excited uh, to be here. <laughs> today is a perfect day for 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 meeting. We you are meeting for the first time, actually. Yeah. Yes, yes, Michal. It's great. It's great. Uh, just want to say thanks for all the work you've done for the book. So it's it's great to meet uh, for the first time. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, Nick. Okay, so let me start. And uh, mm, I have a you know we are organizing kind of kind of outdoor um, mm, meeting today or book launch event today so basically uh quite happy time for both of us i think and uh, i will briefly introduce you to uh, anyone watching uh, to everyone watching so mr nick majuli is a chief operating officer and data scientist at ritz holtz wealth management as far as i know and uh, nick is also a blogger of of dollars and data com and uh, last but not least uh, nick is also an author of just keep buying book and this is the main reason we are here today so is there anything you would like to add nick no that's perfect yeah that's that's background uh and just one thing if anyone has questions about the book about anything personal finance related feel free to reach out to me on uh on instagram or twitter twitter's at, at dollars and data i'm happy I, i answer every dm so please feel free to send me any questions you have and even if they're in polish i can translate with gpt and we can figure it out so <laughs> <laughs> perfect perfect we'll have a q and a section at, at mm -hmm. the end so basically everyone who would like to ask uh, uh, questions to nick today just please stay and uh, yes we will have such opportunity so uh, what i would like to do today nick is uh, just ask you about the background of the book itself not It's not so much about investing, because I know there will be an upcoming interview with uh, Jacek Lempart, and uh, it's mostly about investing. So basically, we'll try to make this uh, more like a book focused meeting. So if you could tell us, uh, basically, why have you written a book? Uh, what does just keep buying really mean? And uh, if you could just explain in your own words, uh, uh, 
who is the book for basically yeah so i wrote just keep buying as a data-driven guide to personal finance and investing and i basically i just wanted to like go through a bunch of different beliefs we had in and the personal finance community and the investing community and bring data bring evidence and say like is that actually true there's a lot of beliefs that we have out there and i just want to say like does the data show this right and so it wasn't me like coming out with my opinions and what i believe of the world it's like what does the actual evidence show for different things and we can i've gotten into a lot of those topics as you read through there's gonna be certain things that are you know that we challenge some of the conventional wisdom or some of the myths i would say and so i wrote just keep buying as a as a way to kind of like a, a one size fits all solution for how to build wealth for like the typical person, right? This is not trying to, you're not going to become a billionaire with just keep buying, but you can definitely become, you know, hundred thousand or millionaire in terms of dollars. Um, and so that's the, that's the point, right? That's the point is to try and help people that don't really have much knowledge about personal finance and investing and how do they kind of get to the next stage and really progress. And so for who, who's the ideal consumer, someone in their twenties or thirties, someone earlier, right? If, you, if you're 65 years old, it's really tough to do just keep buying because you don't have have that time to really save and invest, right? So you really need to be younger where you have a little bit more time. And so I think someone in their 20s or their 30s, they're just starting to get starting uh, investing. I think that's the perfect time to really read this book and it can really change the trajectory of your life. You can imagine your financial wealth is like on some path. And if I can just tilt the, the slope a little bit, you can imagine how much of an impact that could have. And so that's that's uh, the ideal consumer, someone who's just getting you know out of college, out of university, someone who's kind of just starting their career. That would be the perfect time to get someone. Not in college. It's too early. Once you actually start working, you have a paycheck, you understand the realities of the world. That's where you can start to make decisions that, that can help you with your wealth. Nice, nice. Uh, uh, I'm I'm smiling because uh, it really is the way I I was reading the book. So basically, for me, it was like, oh my gosh, it's so great. It's so you know, every young people, uh, every young man, women should read it basically. And uh, mm, uh, I would like to ask you: Is there just to clarify? Is there are there any prerequisites to reading the book or requirements or should anyone reading the book have any knowledge about investing uh, or or no? I don't think you need much of anything. You need to know like the, the basic level, like just like, you know, you have an idea of what a stock is, right? And I, even then I do explain what stocks, equities, business ownership, whatever you want to call that. Like I explain that as shares, like... I do explain that in that in that relevant chapter, but I always say, you know, my uh, my grandmother, who's uh, 76 years old now, she read the book and she understood 80 percent of it. And so, like for someone who literally has never you know invested a day in her life and she understood most of it, I think that's what makes it accessible. And the other thing, too, is like, yes, I talk about being data driven and stuff, but every chapter starts with some sort of story or some sort of lesson that's yeah. that's bigger than just the investing point, because I know people get bored to death just reading about numbers and things like that. So it's like, is there an analogy I can use that'll that'll help you? Think through this problem before we dig into the math. Nice. So let me get back to the beginning, very early beginning of the book idea, I would say. Uh, when it started in your head and how long have you been working on the book itself? So how it kind of came about, actually, it happened because of COVID in, in a lot of ways, because it was late 2020. And by that point, so I live in New York City. So in March 2020 is when kind of that first big wave happened. It was mostly in New York, at least at least in the zeitgeist of like everyone was talking about it and what was happening around the world. Everyone was very focused on New York. That big wave happened, you know, NBA shut down. That's when things got very serious. And then um, that that wave ended. And then I thought it was over. I was like, oh, we flattened the curve. We did it, guys. But I'm very wrong, obviously. Right. <laughs> then the ne then the rest of the United States started to see it much worse. Right. And that's when that curve started to go up. And then I was like, you know what? Once they get through it, then we're going to be good. Right. And I obviously I was still very naive, very wrong. And then in December 2020, the end of the year, like I just saw the most cases I've ever seen. It was just crazy how and I was like, we're and then I got super pessimistic. I was like, we're going to be trapped forever. So I was like, I need to take this time and like utilize it to create something, to create something that's like I've been writing on the Internet for four years now. Like, I think there's something out there. And so I took some of my best work, about 60% of the book was older material that I'd kind of rehashed and restructured. And then 40% was brand new. So my, even my, my audience who had followed me for a long time would be reading a lot of new material. So I basically put that together. I said, let's come up with an overarching philosophy for like my personal finance investing philosophy and then present that to the world. And that's kind of how it came about, basically. Nice, nice. I remember the story about the uh, florist guy in the shopping mall. 
mm-hmm. uh, in the book, and yeah, I, you you just recalled the the uh, the uh, this this uh, this story to me, and yeah, uh, definitely check out the book. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking to all all all, all people watching. So. Um, mm, I'm interested. Uh, I'm interested. Were you approached by publisher about the book, or were you searching for publisher? How 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 did the process look like? Because you know, I'm self publisher, so basically I do my stuff uh, all by mm, myself. Basically, I publish my books, but I know that, that the process of searching for publisher could be quite time consuming. I know the story of you know the author of Harry Potter who was uh, looking for publisher and uh, being refused for several times. So how did the process look uh, from your perspective? So it was December 2020 and I uh, I was on Twitter and I knew so Harriman House had published, you know, Morgan Housel's book Psychology of Money and a bunch of other people within yep. FinTwit like Laws of Wealth, Daniel Crosby, etc. right? Geometry of Wealth, uh, Brian Portnoy, I can go on. Anyways, I was like, "Hey, they seem like they're a great company to work with. A lot of people work with them." I just slid into their DMs and said, "Hey, like I have two different book ideas and like I want to write a book. And I want to see what we can do." And they knew who I was. They were following me, so it wasn't like I was unknown to them. So yeah. then we started chatting and we went back and forth and we said, OK, hey, I think uh, funny enough the my first book idea, which became Just Keep Buying independently, they said, we thought it would be really cool if you wrote a book like kind of like what you just pitched us. Right. So they kind of already independently said, hey, this is a good idea for you to write. And then you came and said, hey, I want to write something like this. And at the time, they weren't going to call it Just Keep Buying. I think the, the, the title is going to be very different and I didn't like it. And then eventually we got to the title and I kind of re framed everything but like it was in the process that we figured out that yeah it's gonna be called just keep buying that's gonna be the intro chapter and then everything's gonna be built off of that so that's kind of how it happened i i went to them and they already knew who i was which was helpful and i already had an audience which is helpful so like if you're if you're trying to be an author i say i would suggest if you're trying to write a book like have an audience have some proof of concept it makes it a lot easier for a publisher to say you know to even take the risk to to publish your book and all of that and of course you can self-publish and you can do that a lot of people have have done it um and you can even make more money by self-publishing if it does really well you can make a lot more money right think about it like you don't have to split anything with the publisher there's just more risk and the publisher takes care of a lot of things for you so there's trade-offs obviously and so i personally like going with publishers i don't want to have to deal with individual rights for every country and like they'll back and forth and like i guess you could hire an agent there's a lot of ways you can do this and i just like the the ease of using a publisher and i just got to focus on the writing which is i think the most important part of the process nice uh, it's great to hear that uh, you talk about the building audience first and then just uh, contacting the right people basically or being contacted by the right people yeah that's 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 how it works so basically yeah i fully agree i fully agree the audience definitely helps and uh, um but i'm listening to you and i see that uh, it looks like a very streamlined process or very simple and easy process. Yeah, yeah, you had an idea, you contact, contacted the publisher, you wrote the book. But mm-hmm. I'm just wondering, because I I sometimes, when I write a book on any topic, I, I have something like imposter syndrome, basically, uh, when I'm always questioning myself whether, I, whether I'm skilled enough or whether do I, you know, when I really do have the right to publish a book on the specific topic, you know? And uh, I'm just wondering what the emotional side of writing the book, especially in the COVID time, uh, looked like from your perspective. Yeah, so for me at the time, I was very much into like, hey, like, I'm not, I know what you're saying, like, oh, I feel like an imposter about something. For me, I'm always like, what does the data say, right? And so, like, I'm trying to take okay. myself out of it as much as possible. It's impossible to not be biased in, in one way or another. But, like, for me, like, the one thing to keep in mind is, like, what is the, inf- what does, like, the evidence say? And then present that. And so I say, hey, here's what the evidence says. Like, I have opinions ar- around that evidence, and I will present those. And there is some bias that will come across. But, like, for the most part, I try and let the data do the talking, of course. Um so that's kind of how I look at it. When I was like writing this stuff or thinking about this, I wasn't like, oh, I'm not, I'm this like young kid. I published this when I was 32 years old. Like, why would you listen to me? It's like, well, what does the evidence say? What would have worked, right? If like, if you had followed this in the past, you can back test, right? You can back test wealth building, right? Definitely. In a lot of ways you can look back and say, okay, if you had done this and followed, and this is not like doing something extravagant, like, okay, you're picking Apple and Amazon. Like, I'm not telling you to pick the top winners, which would be a very difficult thing. This is something that like anyone could have done back then. They could have went and they could have purchased a, 
Or they could have gone and purchased a you know S and P five hundred ETF. They could have bought an index fund. They could have done all these things, and they would have been relatively straightforward. Of course, holding for many decades is not easy, but it gets into a lot of those issues. How do you hold through drawdowns? What do you? How do you reframe how you think about it? And you'll and you obviously know this very well, and you've written about it before. But like, kind of just taking this data and evidence that that I didn't really see there in the same way, and just presenting it to a new audience, basically. It's it's quite interesting how how can you you know work with a data? I really admire it. Basically, the the book I said that to my audience that this book is the book I show have written. Yeah, basically. So uh, really, I'm so connected to everything that that's in the book. You know, it's a natural flow of uh, you know data and facts, and then um, um, some summaries about that and some stories around that, and it's it's flowing. Basically, it's a uh, it's a financial book that, from my perspective, is being read as <laughs> you know fiction. Uh, I mean, fiction book. Yeah. So basically, mm -hmm. you have a story, and this story, you know, it evolves, 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 and then. You hit the last page in the book, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So but, it talks about this, and it's really it's the whole thing is kind of laid out like over like the you know the trajectory of someone's life, right? You start at yeah, like exactly. what I call there's two sections: there's a saving section and an investing section, and kind of over the course of your life, you should expect to go from one where you're focused only on saving and how do I spend less money, how do I grow my income to as you get older, it's mostly about like, okay, how am I going to manage my investments to get through this next phase, right? And obviously, it varies within each country and how you do it. And there's so many like little details that you can't cover for every single market. But that's that's why, you know, I work with someone like you to, to help with those types of things. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Thank you. <laughs> so what was the most difficult uh, during the process of uh, writing and publishing of the book uh, most difficult thing is just like the structure i think every with every book it's like how am i going to structure this like once you get the structure i'm not going to say the writing's easy because like i relied on blog posts and things so like it wasn't necessarily easy but it's much easier if i just say okay in this chapter you're going to write about this in this chapter you're going to write about this okay but which chapter should i include which chapter should i remove like that's the hard. those are the harder questions right it's like how do i present it's not just like, can you talk about this topic? Like if once you've been writing for a while, like I could write a, a blog post about just about anything, whether it would be good or not is debatable. But like my point <laughs> is that's not the hard part is the writing. The hard part is like, what do I want to say? And I only have so much time to say it. So how do I structure it in that way? That's kind of the big question. Yeah, I was listening to Morgan Housel uh, just a few days ago and uh, to he said in the interview that uh, basically the difficult part is how to cut all those unnecessary words and sentences, basically. So how to limit the book uh, just to the story you want to tell, uh, basically. Yeah. Um, and I and I fully agree. And I fully agree. Uh, the the <laughs> uh, I would say the web page can be as long as you wish yeah but still if you want to fit everything into into a book which is easy to read you have to somehow uh cut the story yeah and uh, sell only the necessary uh, tell only the necessary things so did you did you had any expectations about what will be the uh number of copies sold of the book within i don't know probably three months or one year so within three months, I didn't have any expectations within a year. I was hoping because like you hear a lot of things like most books don't sell more than like 5000 copies or something. I was like, exactly. okay, that's that's a fair that's like for the typical person publishing a book. If you sell like 5000 copies, that's like a big success, right? Because like most books don't sell that much. But I was like, hey, I have a big audience like I had like 20,000 email subs. I'm like, am I only going to sell 5000 copies? Like even if like I'm not expecting every email sub to, to buy my book, obviously. But my point was like. I think it's I think there I have more of an audience of some proof of concept. I know these ideas have kind of done well. So I was like, I thought within a year, my like base case was 20 to 30,000 total sales in a year. Right. Um, and we ended up going much past that. We had like 70,000 global sales within the first year, which was like very, you know, nice. I was like kind of shocked by it. I didn't I was not expecting that. I said 50K was like beyond my wildest dreams. And we're at 70,000, which is more more than I could have <laughs> expected. So crazy. Mm -hmm. Crazy, crazy! How many copies of uh, Just Keep Buying were sold or already? Because you are uh, the launch was, as far as I remember, April, April, April twenty twenty two. So it's been about a year yeah. and a half. And so yeah. as I said, we sold seventy thousand in the first year. Well, 
since then we sold a hundred thousand more so we're at 170 000 copies which is crazy and it's worldwide right and stuff crazy. still come, every day like data comes in and it changes so like even between now and you know when like you know by the end of the year who knows what'll change i know i have more data coming from japan i have no idea how it's going to do in poland it's already been doing well so far i mean so i just just off pre-orders and i really appreciate everyone who's you know taking the time to, to order it so that's very nice um so thank you for that <laughs> but yeah it's 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 going to be interesting to see what happens but yeah we'll just just waiting and, and waiting to see yeah how many copies uh, i mean how how many editions international editions do you already have i think we have i mean that have been published i think there's like six right now that have been actually published six or seven because right there's like the indian english edition there's the marathi which is indian edition there's the indonesian there's german uh there's the japanese the korean the taiwanese and then obviously poland's coming out now so we're Polish, at about yeah. eight and i probably forgot one so yeah it's but there's more and there's like one in arabic that's supposed to come out vietnamese there's a lot that are like planned but they probably may not come out for another year or so so we're kind of waiting to see uh okay so uh, talking about the international publishers um i know you you have to rely on international publishers if you want to expand globally and uh, to the local languages but my question is uh how difficult is it to to trust people being somewhere there on the other end of the <laughs> of mm -hmm. the world that they will do a good job that, that 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 they won't destroy your book in any way uh, well, I mean, at the end of the day, this is why I used a publisher uh, and <laughs> okay. I worked with Harriman because they've had relationships with a lot of these publishers. They've published other books for yeah. these people. And so I think there's a lot of incentives to do the right thing. And so it's like if you have a publisher out there saying something that's not true or like r mistranslating you or something, that's not going to look good for them. It's and it's going to you know hurt their business. Right. So I think the long, long story short is like if you do good work for a publisher, you're going to get more work from them. Right. So, for example, in Japan in particular, like the person that translates psychology of money ended up translating, you know, just keep buying and psychology of money did very nice. well there and, and just keep buying is doing quite well there as well. So it's like a, it's like one of these things where like if they had done badly there, they probably wouldn't have gotten the business for future books. Right. Just not even me, but anyone else. So the, exactly. the trust part, like, yes, it's tough. Like, do I know how many copies I'm actually selling internationally? No, I have to trust the people that just, you know, are, are telling me. And so we hope that that's accurate. We hope all this. And it's just like, it's about business sense. And like, do you want us to, if we, if we found out that you were faking numbers or something, we would never work with you again. You'd lose a lot more money than you would gain by just being honest. So I think most people know that like, honesty is the best policy in globalization. And I hope that that's kind of what people do. And that's, you know, we just have to hope for the best. That's all we can really do at the end of the day. Exactly, exactly. I'm not talking about faking the numbers because mm -hmm. it's uh, obvious, I would say. Uh, <sighs> yeah, let, don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I'm talking about is basically uh, basically the quality of the translation itself or making it uh, local because really, honestly, I do know how difficult it is to translate the book. I mean, I spent, I spent more time on Just Keep Buying and Polish Edition uh, and it's Polish edition, then on writing and publishing of my own book. So basically, and you could say it's just a translation. Yeah, it's not a translation. It's an, I would say, um, it's a Polish language edition. So basically, it's uh, not one to one tr translation. And uh, uh, I'm just wondering, <laughs> based on what you said so far, um, I, I, I was unknown to, to, to your publisher. Basically, I was a new name to them to them mm -hmm. and uh, I know that uh, you had an impact on uh, who are you trusting <laughs> in Poland basically so mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering if you could tell me what convinced you to accept my offer for Polish uh, translation of just keep buying I mean so once again we you know we look through names and stuff and I looked I looked you up a little bit I'm like hey so this per I didn't I had no idea now, now looking back like I wouldn't even have I, if I ever publish another book and I'm going to pull on I'm not gonna even ask I won't even assuming you're in for the project I won't even I don't even ask like whatever just give me some terms we'll do it right so like <laughs> it's one of these things where like I had no idea that like the level of effort you were gonna put into it that's a, that's amazing but I was like hey this person's actually a personal finance author and so I think there's a difference between just a trans translation, which is like, take this word and turn into that word, which is like, you have to obviously know languages very well. And like, that's one thing you have to know cultures and you have to know probably a little bit about finance, but like someone who's actually a financial thinker translating, it's a very different thing. Cause you'll be like, actually this chapter, which is very relevant for like an American audience is not relevant for a Polish audience. So 
as I said, like most of my books, I would say are translations. And I think this one is actually an adaptation, which is a completely different thing because you're saying, you know what, we're not going to talk about the 401k, we're going to talk about these things instead, we're not going to talk USD, we're going to talk loaded, you know, and so you're you're translating everything across or I'm sorry, adapting everything across. And so, you know, the reason why I obviously I didn't know all of that ahead of time that you were going to put in that level of effort. And that's great that you that you have. But I was just like, this person actually knows personal finance. So that's kind of the the thing that's like, I, you know, if I have to pick like if I have to pick just some random translator, <laughs> someone who knows like the background who wrote Finance Ninja, all this type of stuff. Right. Like, I'm like, I'm going to pick the personal finance person. Right. In this case, I obviously I have no regrets whatsoever. So, you know, I already know I know where I'm publishing future uh, Polish books, you know. Um, <laughs> with me yeah perfect <laughs> thank you nick thank you nick uh, it's a uh, honey for my heart <laughs> basically okay so um, from the other perspective uh one and a half year passed since uh, the launch of the just keep buying book and are there any topics or things that you would do differently right now within the book uh would you would you change something knowing that uh just keep buying will become the global uh, bestseller. Yeah, so there are there's I think there's three things I would change. Uh, first, and let me try and do rank order them in importance. First is I would have done a little bit more focus on I'm less focus on US markets only. And don't get me wrong, I do talk about international stocks. I talk about mm -hmm. them a little bit, but I think I would have expanded that even more and like even had things in there where I'm like, hey, if you're an international investor, here's how you might buy US stocks, right? Because I didn't know this at the time, but like the sales internationally or I mean, now I know this are are larger than the sales in the US, which is like mind boggling to me, because if you look at my blog views and stuff like that, most of that is US viewers, right? It's like, you know, mm -hmm. and so I would have no clue that my that just keep buying was going to sell better internationally than it did in the US and which it has. And it's I mean, it's done well in the US, but it's done much better um, abroad. So just in terms of total sales. Um, and so when I look at that, I'm like, okay, I probably would have focused more on international stuff, focus then. So obviously I'm never going to be able to do like the Polish adaptation within that. That's not possible, but I would have focused more internationally Two, I would have, uh, added a little bit more on inflation. You have to realize in the context when I was writing, the inflation data was still low. And I did talk about inflation in the book, but inflation just spiked like, like no one's exactly. business. And I think it makes it seem like I thought inflation is not a big deal. And I, I never say that, but I just I'm in the world of low inflation, low rates. And to see rates and inflation go up so much, I think I wish I'd address that a little bit more because it would have been nice. If I were ever to do like a second edition, I will address inflation more. And third, and this is more this is more something I've learned since. And I think I've spent more time in. I would have spent a lot more time just finding like one good quote in every chapter, like just one quote. And so okay. some chapters do have some pretty good quotes, but like I think what Morgan Housel said is like people don't remember chapters, they remember quotes. They remember like good lines. And so like having a few more one liners and just spending that time, like how do I summarize this entire idea in one line and just putting that line somewhere in there? I think that's important because you want a takeaway. You want that shareable quote because oh, where's that from? Oh, it's from this thing. And I think like the one thing when I look at like very successful books, like for example, Psychology of Money is such a great example of this. Like literally exactly. there's probably 50 really good quotes in that book. I mean, really good. Not like, oh, it's okay. Like really good quotes. You take one of those 50 and it's like, oh, where's that from? Oh, it's from this. Oh, it's from this. And so they're all just anchors pointing back to the core product. So if I were to write another book, I'm going to try and make it far more quotable. And and I think, and of course that's difficult. It's difficult to take everything and, and put it in just to a few words. Just keep buying it. That The title is actually pretty good because it does that idea. It says just keep investing, keep focusing on, you know, building wealth, buying income, producing assets, et cetera. But I wish I had done that more in even in the individual chapters within the book. So those are the three things, more international focus, probably more focus on inflation and then, um, you know, more quotable. That's that's my my tips after after going through this. OK, on the last point, I would agree and disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, agree. Yeah, you are right. But disagree that uh, you already did that, in my opinion, because there is a last chapter which summarizes the whole book. And you say it's a just keep buying playbook, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah, so uh, yes, you already have uh, those sentences, I would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, in your book, I think what's very important are the charts. And basically, you can just, you know, take take a phone, just uh, take a photo of the chart and send it to social media with small comment. And basically, it, it does the job, in my opinion. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so it's it's different book than Psychology of Money. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say it's uh, quotable in different way. Okay, yeah, that's great. Yeah. No, and I appreciate you saying that because remember, I'm 
I'm looking at it from a very different, like, you know, I'm, I don't even know, like, I, it's hard to like judge yourself and like kind of really know your, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, know. I know my work obviously, but it's like, I don't know how good of a quote something is. Like there's certain quotes I love that I don't think maybe, um, don't resonate as much with people. And maybe there's some that I just didn't think much of. And like, wow, like I look at like my top Kindle highlights and like the top things that people highlight. And none of those things are things I would say are like, um, particularly like exactly. quotes that I would think of, but people love them. And so I, I think that's the other thing too, is I, as an author, I'm a little bit disconnected. So that's a fair point you bring up. Yeah, you are you are biased. You are, mm-hmm. you have outer bias. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, and I fully agree. It's difficult. It's difficult somehow to tell how the people would read my book, basically. And mm-hmm. uh, for example, for my books, I I always give them to early reviewers. I would say uh, close friends who who are reading it, and you know everyone everyone does have different opinions on on different parts. So basically, people are different. Yeah, and everyone, you know, you, you could be even the same person and you read the book, then you come back to the book two years later and you read it once again and you see completely different things. Yeah, out very, of it. Very true. Same book. Very true. Yeah. I completely yeah. agree with that. Okay, so let's um, start to wrap up, but uh, I have to ask you the question about investing. So I'm, I will ask you, how do you invest personally? I mean, does your portfolio composition follow uh, the just keep buying rules and uh, just keep buying strategy or not? Maybe you have some nuances. No, no, no. I follow it completely. I mean, the the mantra in the book, which is, I say, the most quotable part, right, is, you know, the continual purchase of a diverse set of income producing assets, right? Continual diverse income producing assets. Those are the three things, right? So continual purchase, I'm still buying. That never changes. I'm not selling anything, right? Um Diverse. I own a very diverse portfolio of like, you know, I can go through it a little bit like there's, you know, obviously U.S. equities. Please do. Please do. Um, yeah, there's like U.S. equities. There's international equities, which is broken out between developed markets and emerging. There's a U.S. real estate investment trust called REITs. They're basically just real estate that's owned by a big company and they pay out dividends. Right. And REITs have not done well recently. So trust me. <laughs> like I, I have assets that aren't doing as well as others like, like S&P 500, U.S. stocks doing well, REITs, U.S. REITs, not so much. Um, I have fixed income, which is always intermediate or less. So I don't I don't have anything over a five year. I'll never own. I'll, I don't want to say never, but unless rates got really, really high, and it's like this is a once in a lifetime deal. Like, I don't think I'll ever own like a 10 year, 20 year, you know, treasury bond or or any sort of debt of that sort. Right? I think everything I'm going to own is less than five years. And most of the stuff I have in now is treasury bills because they're just they're paying basically, you know, pretty high. So I think for me, it's just figuring out like, what are those income producing assets? How much is of all those things I said, how much is that in my portfolio? That's like 90%. I mean, it at one point, I think it was, I think it, now it's more than 90 because I, I had some private investments. I had a little bit of, you know, I have some crypto technically, which is like 2% and like Bitcoin basically. I have a very small amount in a bunch of these little things. Um, some of those private investments, like I, I, because of what happened in 2022, like I, I'm kind of revalue them almost to zero because I think a lot of there's these companies are still around. I still own the shares, but like they've they've had to take a down round. Like they're probably not worth the same. So I'm just holding them at zero. I'm, I'm if they ever sell one day and I make my money back, great. But I'm not expecting to. Right. And so that's that yeah. was a tough period after going through you know November 21 through 22. I basically said, hey, I have to write these things off to zero. And so I just took like the the L the it, you know the zero on my balance sheet. I hold them at zero even though my cost basis is higher. Right. So that's an example of like, you know, I, that was, that's not an income producing asset. And so it's funny the all the parts of my portfolio that have done like really poorly have generally been non-income producing assets and all the ones that even REITs, mm-hmm. which haven't done that well, you know, REITs are down whatever, 20, 30%, they're not down 90%, right? And that's, that's, there's a huge difference in that. Even, even asset classes that are struggling are still doing okay versus asset classes that, you know, like that are speculative are just doing terribly. Right. And so I would say for the most part, as I said, you know, 90 something percent of my assets are in are in uh, income producing assets. And that that uh, allocation will change over time. And it should change because information changes to be like, oh, I'm just going to have a 80, 20 portfolio and never think about it. It's just not true because w- when rates are zero, there, it, there's a lot of evidence to take more equity risk. Right? It's like, why would I pay? You know, what's the point? OK, yes, there's some diversification. I, and talks about that, you know, when stocks fall, bonds tend not to fall as much. Right. But. Now, like with rates as high as they are, we're kind of doing the opposite thing. I, it's probably a lot of people are like, why would I go and take equity risk when I can just get 5% for free in the United States, at least 5% with uh, with very little risk in treasury bills. And so 
it, it's a very different conversation today. So I don't believe in this. I used to believe more when I was much more naive. I'd say, oh, just set it and forget it. But that's it's really tough because information changes. And as information changes, you have to kind of make tweaks and say, hey, maybe maybe I'm not putting all of my money you know, into my diversified portfolio in the same way. Maybe I'm kind of moving. I'm just kind of shifting around new flows, right? Moving wages. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, for example, my retirement accounts are buying the same things they've always bought. I'm still buying the same, you know, I do have some tilts to like value stocks, small cap stocks, things like that within the US and even internationally. But for the most part, those are still buying the same thing. But like with my money outside of that, which I might need sooner, I'm probably just putting more into treasury bills right now because, you know, they're paying so well. So, you have to think about that, think about goals. I eventually want to buy a house at some point. And so it's like, I need to save a down payment for that. And guess what? That needs to be in quote cash or in this case, treasury bills, yeah. right? So yeah. all these little things impact how you make those decisions. And so I just want to say like, there is no right solution. And I talk about in the book, there is no right solution. There are people out there listening to this. And I'm like, I'm just going to own real estate. I'm going to be a real estate, to, you know, uh, I'm going to be a landlord. That's fine. People have gotten rich doing that. I'm saying there's trade offs associated with that. I'm not saying that's wrong or right. It's just there's trade offs. And so understand the trade offs of whatever your portfolio is. I personally don't like dealing with tenants. I don't want to have to do any of that, deal with a broken pipe or whatever. I'm just like, hey, I just want to own like financial securities, mostly equities. And that's what I do. And that's how I invest. And that's how I'm going to keep investing. Nice. Nice. Uh, just, just to clarify, you basically own. Uh, talking about the stock or bonds, uh, you basically own ETFs. In, in not the ETFs, mostly some index funds, but yeah. mostly ETFs. Yeah, I, I'm a basically a hundred percent ETF. I've had individual stocks at times, but every single time it's basically been a mistake. And I and there's a reason <laughs> I put it put in the book. I don't I don't recommend it for a host of reasons. So I don't have any individual positions like that. I mean, the only thing I have like that. Is like private companies and even then i did that because it was like the times and everyone's oh you got to just put a little bit and so i'm like i'll put a little bit what if this thing ends up going 10x right so i put a very small amount not even one percent of my net worth small amount of money in there and most of those have gone to or i think are at zero now so it's like it goes to show i should have just bought the s p 500 all along and just stop you know thinking about it but hey you know you live and learn and it's better to lose a little bit of money now than to do that when i'm 65 and lose a lot of money right so that's kind of the the thinking Exactly, exactly. And I really like what you talked uh, when you talked that you have a little bit of crypto and so on and so on, because, mm -hmm. you know, you, you have to be open to uh, to give a chance uh, to the specific asset class. But still, risk management is uh, uh, quite important. And I would say most important even. Uh, but uh, uh, just just, you know, I added a lot of comments to your book. So basically, I will comment also on the diversification. You said, OK, re REITs are down uh, this year and so on. Yeah, that's that's actually that's uh, part of the divers diversification that uh, you, you will always have an uh, asset classes which are growing. And uh, mm, I would say uh, increasing the value of your portfolio. And still, if you div diversify, you will always have also the asset classes that are down, basically. So uh, that's. That's the part of the game, yeah, if you want to diversify. Yeah, yeah, and you would hope that over a long enough period, <clears throat> all of those assets would be up in some regard, maybe not bonds for yeah. a host of reasons, but you'd hope that most asset classes, like even though, yes, REITs are down now, you'd hope over the long term, like they do eventually reach a new high. And so that was my hope buying them. Obviously, you know, it's you might have to wait a long time. You can wait 10, 15 years before asset classes turn around. And so that's that's the reality. And that's kind of what's going on with like developed market stocks. I think European stocks in particular, you know, haven't done great over the last few decades. And so Definitely. I, I'm still I still owning them because if you look from like 1970 to, you know, you look to like, I think the 2000s, like they were basically neck and neck with the US. And so the US has just pulled away since. Will that continue to happen? If it does, I live in the US. I have a lot of exposure. I'm going to be fine. Um, if it if it flips and develop starts doing well and US doesn't, well, guess what? I have that as well. So I kind of have both sides of it, you know, um, that, that that should work out. So. Yeah, exactly, exactly. First decade of, of 21st century, uh, basically, uh, US was, uh, I would say, flat uh, mm -hmm. over the time and uh, emerging markets were actually driving the increase of the values of portfolios, basically, for, for people who invested in it. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah I, I would stop about uh, the, the the investing topics maybe we'll leave that uh, for q and a if people would like to know uh, more and uh, but the last uh, i would s give you the voice for the last a uh, few words for for Polish readers who are and uh, of the poprostu kupu book so just <laughs> keep buying in Polish 
who basically trusted us, both of us, and bought the book. And they are today with us um, just sharing the, the happiness of launching of the book. So basically, is there anything you would like to add? Uh, I just want to say thanks for supporting the book. Uh, hope I hope you enjoy it, obviously. And, I, you know, I haven't read the full adaptation. I do need to go through and read it, obviously. And like I'm translating like I've translated pages at a time, right? Because it's like I have to th run it all through ChatGPT. And so it's so cool to kind of read your commentary. And I, I've, I've already read the forward and everything. It's very nice what you said. But yeah, just as I said, if you guys have further questions, like, you know, ask me there or you know, in the future, it just feel free to, to DM me on Instagram at Nick Majuli. On Twitter, I'm at dollars and data. I try to answer everyone in this case and in Polish. I can copy paste translate. It's very easy. I'll probably I'll send it back and hopefully a Polish uh, translation. So thank you very much, Nick, then. And uh, uh, it was a pleasure to host you today. And uh, still, we are moving up with with the next uh, with the next topics. Thank you very much. Appreciate me all. Thank you. I have to unmute myself and uh, you too. Hello, Nick. <laughs> Hello. Welcome back. It was cool I watching was, it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I was having fun. Um, uh, Nick, I think we have to celebrate anyway, because it's a celebration time, right? Uh, so uh, my idea is to open a bo bottle of champagne. What about you? Oh, let me go. Let me go get mine. I'm gonna grab mine. For the first <laughs> okay, game. okay, okay. I will definitely open mine. So, we will celebrate. I, I also be prepared. I'm sure I don't have champagne today, but I'm going to have a nice drink of prosecco. Not that we are just going to drink it in the pub. Champagne is already drunk, right? But so or so, I open the bottle. Listen. Now the next part will be the presentation. I'm going to talk to you about it. But I think it will be może być całkiem zabawnie. Gabi mu w ogóle mówiła, słuchaj, nie, nie, ten, nie, nie można na antenie otwierać e, alkoholu, ale w sumie czemu nie? Uh, do we do a synchro? Okay, let's do it. Hang on, let me For... get, let me, hang on, hang on. One second, one second. Tell me when you're ready. Bro. I'm getting very close. You're probably gonna beat me, but okay. Hang on. No, 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 I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Okay, let's get. I will little... count. Uh, I will count. This is actual three. champagne. Got it for this little mini bottle. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. You were smarter yeah, than me. I will have to drink uh, on the whole bottle, right okay. now. Okay. Let's. Uh, yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Three. Uh, let's do it on uh, okay, one. This is gonna be tough. <laughs> on one. Let's try. Let's try. Okay. On one. Not okay. on zero. On one. Three, two, one. Okay. Oh, God, I'm a little <laughs> I was first, I think. Oh, you got me. Well, uh, as uh, they say, uh, nas, nasdrovia. Nasdrovia. Very good. Uh, nasdrovia. I've learned. Uh, I've learned. Uh, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> you are the best. Uh, uh, nasdrovia, Michal. And just, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for everything you've done. I mean, you've really just the signing. I know you guys saw you signed 10,000 books. Like, incredible just such a great job that everything so much work you put into this you're putting more work than your own book because you treat it like your own and i truly appreciate it i'm definitely going to come to warsaw and come visit at some point i promise nice so. nice okay i'll translate that uh, oczywiście, że Nick mi podziękował za to, że podpisałem 10 tysięcy egzemplarzy książki, ale powiedział, że zdecydowanie przyjedzie do Warszawy. Słyszeliście to, prawda? E, dla jasności, rozmawialiśmy wcześniej z Nikiem e, o tym, żeby przyjechał na premierę i to się nie udało, ale oczywiście jak zobaczył, ile pracy zostało włożone w to, żeby książkę tutaj nadmuchać, e, to powiedział, że przyjedzie jakoś w przyszłym roku do Warszawy. Także Nick, see you next year in Warsaw, definitely. And yeah. we'll do something fun. Oh, that'd be awesome. I would <laughs> love to get a tour. Okay, let's drink it and we'll uh, move move on. Mm. Tastes good. Fantastic. Ah. Okay, I will switch to Polish. Uh, and then we'll get uh, into the Q&A section. But uh, you will probably see what I'm showing on the slides. Uh, okay? I will mute you. No dobra, moi drodzy, to co? Jedziemy dalej chyba z tą, z tą prezentacją. Pamiętajcie, przedsprzedaż trwa, przedsprzedaż będzie trwała do 30 listopada. E, tak sobie założyłem, że przedsprzedażą obejmujemy nie tylko okres prawdziwej przedsprzedaży, czyli do momentu premiery, ale również czas dwóch tygodni takich premierowych, kiedy ta książka rzeczywiście się pojawia, kiedy macie szansę po pierwsze ją przeczytać, 
Po drugie, być może podzielić się informacją o tym, jaka fajna to jest książka z innymi osobami, które być może pod wpływem waszej opinii również będą chciały swój własny egzemplarz kupić i bardzo bym nie chciał, żeby ktokolwiek był stratny. Czytaj, jeżeli uznacie, że warto kupić czy to egzemplarze na prezenty, czy kupić egzempl- kolejne egzemplarze powiedzmy, na prezenty, czy kupić, czy polecić znajomym, to chcę, żeby mieli szansę załapać się na te warunki przedsprzedażowe, bo one są po prostu fajne i o tym będę jeszcze, jeszcze chwilę mówił. Ale to, co chciałbym dzisiaj zrobić, to pokazać Wam także kulisy tego, co się działo w ciągu ostatniego tygodnia i nie tylko. Nie będę mówił o samej książce, o procesie jakby tłumaczenia tej książki i tak dalej, bo on jest taki mało widowiskowy. No generalnie siedziałem przed komputerem i, i zrobiłem pracę, tak? Cała filozofia. Ale to, co się działo przez ostatnie kilka dni, w, jak podpisywaliśmy te książki, to, co się dzieje ogólnie, żeby te książki, żeby 10 tysięcy egzemplarzy książki, czy tam 8, czy tyle, ile zamówiliście, czy 9, no zaraz się dowiemy, ile zamówiliście, wysłać w miarę sprawnie, dosyć szybko, no to jest ta trudniejsza część tego, tego zadania. I teraz chcę Wam pokazać, zacząć od rzeczy najtrudniejszej i najgorszej, czyli od tego, w jakim stanie mogą przyjść książki do magazynu. Oczywiście to nie dotyczy całego nakładu, dotyczy tylko części, ale może popatrzcie na to, jak wygląda ta praca tych osób, które są w magazynie, żeby do Was wysłać dobrą książkę. Bo to nie jest takie oczywiste, że książka, która przyjeżdża z drukarni jest książką dobrą. Zdarzają się uszkodzenia, niestety. Oczywiście próbujemy je wszystkie wyłapać, ale nie zawsze się udaje. Zobaczcie, tutaj jest książka, która jest uszkodzona. Nie? A okładka w jakiś sposób zagnieciona. Inny przykład, no słuchajcie, no papier, który wystaje gdzieś tam na dole. Nick, I'm showing uh, the, the, uh, you know, the bad copies and uh, telling the people that uh, the background process is to check for the quality. Yeah? <laughs> okay. so, y, więc więc no widzicie, jak to wygląda. Zdarzają się różne uszkodzenia, czy to pobrudzenia książek, czy to gdzieś tam z, z źle zjechała z, y, po prostu z linii produkcyjnej. E, po prawej stronie widzicie na przykład lakier, który się rozjechał na okładce. Tak? Czyli lakier powinien być na literach, a on się niestety roz, rozjechał troszeczkę z tym, jak okładka wygląda. A po lewej stronie macie tak zwaną kapitałkę, czyli to, co jest na szczycie książki, to, to takie ładne tutaj zielone, tak? no to widzicie, że, te, że to jest, też, też może być uszkodzone. Albo jeszcze gorsze uszkodzenia, tak? gdzie w ogóle okleina okładki jest w jakiś tam sposób zniszczona, czy to z zewnątrz, czy czy w środku i my żeśmy takich książek wyłuskali chyba ponad 200 egzemplarzy, wydaje mi się, z całego tego nakładu, czyli można powiedzieć 2% książek jest uszkodzonych i to jest generalnie taka, taka norma, nie? gdzieś tam pomiędzy 1,5% a 2% książek, 2% książek jest uszkodzonych. Nie? A więc to oczywiście będzie podlegało reklamacji w drukarni, żeby drukarnia wiedziała, yy, yy, jakie sytuacje się zdarzają i też no, lepiej pilnowała też jakości po swojej stronie, żeby jednak te pudełka nie pakować takich egzemplarzy, które przychodzą do nas. Ale to, co chcę powiedzieć, jeżeli macie jakikolwiek problem z waszym egzemplarzem, jeżeli zdarzyło się coś takiego, że książka jest w jakikolwiek sposób uszkodzona, niektóre osoby do nas właśnie pisały, że no, pomimo tego przeglądania przez nas gdzieś tam zdarzają się na przykład strony, które ma, są naddarte czy coś w tym stylu i teraz dopóki to nie przeszkadza, to wszystko super. Ale jeżeli wam to przeszkadza, to jakby no, moją ambicją zawsze było, czy to przy finansowym ninja, czy to przy zaufaniu, yy, czyli waluta przyszłości, czy teraz przy książce po prostu kupuj, żebyście wydostawali taki egzemplarz, który, którym się cieszycie i który jest ok. Tak? Więc jeżeli jakiekolwiek uszkodzenia się zdarzają, to wielka prośba, wyślijcie maila na adres sklep jak oszczędzać małpa, małpa jak oszczędzać pieniądze.pl i napiszcie tam numer swojego zamówienia, najlepiej przyślijcie fotki, co jest nie tak z książką. Będziemy te problemy po prostu na bieżąco rozwiązywać. Tak jak już wiecie, każdy egzemplarz zamówiony przez sprzedaży jest podpisany. Tak? Łącznie podpisałem 10 250 książek, 200 nie podpisałem, nakład liczył 10 450 egzemplarzy i mamy jeszcze, 200 nie podpisałem, bo one są na inne cele, ale do tego w momencie, jeżeli zamawialiście PPK z jakąś inną moją książką, czyli z finansowym ninja albo z zaufaniem, to zadeklarowałem, że wszystkie te książki będą podpisane i nadal to deklaruję, jeżeli w okresie przedsprzedaży zamówicie, po prostu kupuj razem z finansowym ninja albo razem z zaufaniem, to wszystkie książki, które są w tym pakiecie będą podpisane. I teraz jak to wyglądało, jak to wyglądało? A no właśnie, ważna rzecz, Zauważyliście pewnie, że podpisy są w różnych kolorach. Nick, there are different uh, stamps colors in the books. You know? okay. I każdy z tych kolorów mimo wszystko coś oznacza. To znaczy, podobnie było przy finansowym ninja i starałem się podobną kolejność tutaj zachować, czyli kolor czerwony oznacza, że to są książki podpisywane w ciągu pierwszej doby 
tutaj, no załóżmy, że przyjechałem do magazynu o 16 w poniedziałek, czy rozpocząłem podpisywanie koło 16 w poniedziałek, to mniej więcej do 16 we wtorek był kolor czerwony, tak? Od 16 we wtorek był kolor zielony, od 16 w środę był kolor niebieski, w czwartek z magazynu wyjechałem około 13, więc mamy trzy doby podpisywania książki i każdy z Was ma inny kolor tego, znaczy każdy z Was, grupy Was mają inne kolory, z grubsza to oznacza, że jeżeli macie stempel czerwony, to oznacza to, że zamówiliście książkę w pierwszej kolejności, w pierwszych dniach jej przedsprzedaży. Później zielony, później niebieski. Tak? A, także zdekodowałem wam te kolory. A, basically, Nick, uh, you know the whole idea uh, behind uh, color stamps? It's uh, um, the days of the stamping, basically. So, so people who ordered first have a uh, red color, yeah? And the next group, green color. And blue color, uh, the last one. Uh, oczywiście, jeżeli teraz zdarzy się, że przed sprzedaży, czyli do końca e, listopada zamówicie mm, kolejne egzemplarze książki, które przekraczają powiedzmy ten pierwszy nakład 10 tysięcy, to znowu pojadę do magazynu i najprawdopodobniej będzie jeszcze inny kolor stempla w, 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 tych, w tych egzemplarzach. Tak? W, pamiętam, że w finansowym Ninja ostatnim kolorem, którym stemplowaliśmy był bodajże czarny. Nie? Więc być może teraz też będzie czarny kolor. Zobaczymy. Tych kolorów w tuszy trochę jest, więc nie ma, nie ma problemu. I teraz chcę Wam też powiedzieć, że sam proces podpisywania a, w ty, tym razem spróbowałem sobie dodatkowo utrudnić. Na czym polegało to utrudnienie? W Waszych książkach macie wpisane po prostu pełne moje imię. To nie jest buzzgrow, czy taki autograf, powiedzmy, który ja zazwyczaj stosuję, tylko to jest imię Michał. I powiem Wam, że to jest masakra, ponieważ wpisanie całego imienia Michał w taki sposób, żeby ono było czytelne, zajmuje ponad dwa razy tyle czasu, co po prostu taki podpis, jaki był na przykład w zaufaniu, czyli waluta przyszłości. Ale powiedziałem sobie, chcę to zrobić, być może jest to ostatnia okazja, kiedy podpisuję książki, chcę podpisać się dokładnie w taki sam sposób, w jakim w 2012 roku, gdy otwierałem mojego bloga, podpisałem się i umieściłem to na stronie o blogu i o mnie. A, I teraz niektórzy już widziałem w social mediach, pytali, a co się dzieje, jeżeli, znaczy Michał, ty masz ten podpis z takim uśmieszkiem, tak? Mm, e, no nie, imię to jest imię, a uśmieszek to jest bonus, nie? I kiedy się ten bonus przytrafia? To są, po lewej stronie widzicie standardowy podpis, ale na przykład jest taka sytuacja, wrzucę to na pełny ekran, żeby lepiej było widać, jest taka sytuacja, że w niektórych egzemplarzach dodawałem dodatkowe dopiski i trochę tych egzemplarzy jest. Najczęściej te dopiski pojawiały się wtedy, kiedy z moim podpisem działo się coś złego, tak? kiedy mi się nie udał z jakiegoś powodu, a, albo właśnie takie akcje się zdarzały jak w kończący się długopis. Więc dodawałem taki komentarz, że tu się skończył na przykład czwarty długopis, nie? albo to jest pierwszy podpisany e, egzemplarz. Nie? A, jedźmy dalej, poczekajcie, się, że tak powiem, przełączyłem. Albo na przykład osobie, która stemplowała książkę, zdarzył się podpis, zdarzył się stempel do góry nogami. Jest jeden, jedyny egzemplarz, w którym popełniliśmy taki błąd. Jeden, jedyny. A, macie tutaj to zdjęcie, po prostu podpisałem się również do góry nogami i wstawiłem dopisek, że czasami świat staje na głowie. <laughs> Więc ja powiem wam szczerze, miałem sporo zabawy z tymi egzemplarzami, strasznie mi się to podoba. Jak, jak się rąbnąłem, nie napisałem EU na końcu, tylko W, to napisałem, że czasami tak się wymawia. No tego typu, że tak powiem, śmieszne, że tak powiem, sytuacje starałem się obrócić w jeszcze większy żart, po to, żeby dla was zrobić takie egzemplarze, które są unikalne. Ja wiem, że niektórzy mają w nosie w ogóle ten podpis, bo nawet dostawałem takie maile, że ktoś tam, jeden taki mail przyszedł, że ale w ogóle po co te podpisy, czy ja jestem jakimś Eltonem Johnem, czy kimś tam, żeby się autografy swoje udzielać i tak dalej, ale wiem, że wiele osób po prostu to lubi i docenia, że jest taki indywidualny sznyt w tej książce również. Przykład, to, to strasznie się oprzymiałem z tej sytuacji, popełniłem błąd pisząc literę H tak, w swoim imieniu, więc poprawiłem ją tak brutalnie i chciałem napisać, że czasem H nie wychodzi, nie wchodzi i zobaczcie, że w tym drugim H też zrobiłem błąd. Ja więc, że tak powiem, no ja miałem sporo zabawy, a ci, którzy mają takie y, y, egzemplarze, można powiedzieć, w pewnym sensie z nietrafionym podpisem, mają również jakiś e, indywidualny dodatek. Na przykład jak nam się z Ninja źle przystępował, to dopisywałem, czasem zdarzy się kaleka, ale i tak obrotnie. Nie? Albo na przykład, jeżeli się rozmazał troszeczkę ten stempel, e, to też mamy taką informację, że Ninja w tak szybkim ataku, że aż migawka nie wyrabia. Nie? E, więc 
Ciekawy jestem, jakie jeszcze, bo ja wstawiłem wam zdjęcia tylko kilku, ale ciekawy jestem, jakie jeszcze, że tak powiem, fajne rzeczy znajdziecie. O, tu ostatni przykład chyba mam. Jeżeli miałem taką sytuację, że no zacząłem M w jakiś niefortunny sposób, to się zastanawiałem, na co to przerabiać. Akurat tutaj wyszedł mi kwiatek, nie? Okay, Nick, uh, just a quick summary of those slides. Um, basically, if I made any mistake, I tried to I tried to comment on it. So basically, you know, sometimes sometimes I'm I, I'm really bad, you know. Uh, for example, one of the letters is bad, and I try to explain why why it's bad. And even in the explanation, uh, this H is written wrong. <laughs> so I had a lot of fun uh, uh, signing books. Uh, jak wygląda taki proces podpisywania od kuchni, to wam pokażę na, na przykładach. Mogliście to widzieć też na Twitterze, czy gdzieś tam w innych mediach społecznościowych, bo wrzucałem. W dużym uproszczeniu tym razem w ogóle mam spisane czasy po prostu od samego poniedziałku, więc na koniec gdzieś tam wrzucę taką podsumowującą informację, ile średnio szło na egzemplarz, nie? Ale paleta 770 książek zabierała mi około godziny 15 minut, żeby ją podpisać. Takich palet samego po prostu kupuj mieliśmy 14, a do tego doszło jeszcze podpisywanie finansowego Ninja i zaufania, które to w sumie były kolejne trzy palety, czyli można powiedzieć 17 palet książek podpisałem, mniej więcej. Nie? A jak ten proces wyglądał? Jak spojrzycie sobie... Uh, Nick, you can see how many people were involved in signing, in book signing. Uh, macie zdjęcie w jedną stronę i w drugą stronę. Uh, tak wyglądał ten stół. Na tym stole mieliśmy podłożony taki specjalny, uh, specjalne podwyższenie, po którym przesuwaliśmy te książki. I na początku samym, uh, czyli to prawe zdjęcie tam daleko, na początku samym odbywa się otwieranie książek i sprawdzanie ich jakości. Generalnie tam, tam jedna osoba sprawdza jakość. Druga osoba po prostu otwiera na odpowiedniej stronie i podaje tą książkę osobie, która stempluje, która wbija ten, ten stempel. W, każdym, w każdej książce mieliśmy, znaczy w Ninja w zaufaniu i w po prostu kupuj są różne stemple, więc to też sposób umiejscowienia tego stempla, to wszystko było jakby dopracowane, żeby mi też było łatwo książkę podpisać, bo jeżeli ten stempel byłby za bardzo po prawej stronie, to ja nie miałbym na czym oprzeć ręki podpisując książkę. Nie? To, jest taki, to jest taki problem, który się pojawia, więc jakby z, z mojej perspektywy to, co było absolutnie kluczowe, to jest to, żeby stempel był bardziej po lewej stronie, żebym ja jednak mógł oprzeć rękę na książce i wygodnie ją sobie podpisać. Nie chcę wam pokazywać, jak wyglądały moje ręce na koniec, bo to dosyć jednak masakrycznie po czterech dniach podpisywania. Słuchajcie, lecimy dalej. Co tu mamy? Tu mamy wideo, słuchajcie, puszczę to wideo. To jest wideo, które pokazuje, to jest timelapse, który pokazuje w ciągu 37 sekund, puśćmy go od razu, sekundkę, to jest 37 sekund filmu, a pokazuje ten, ten film 71 minut podpisywania 730 egzemplarzy książki, więc no tak to wygląda w praktyce, praca na stojąco. No ale cóż, e, czasem trzeba takie rzeczy po prostu zrobić. E, jeżeli zastanawiacie się na przykład, ile długopisów zostało wypisanych, e, to 14 całych długopisów poszło. 14 długopisów na wszystkie te książki. Czyli można powiedzieć, no, na trochę więcej niż paleta książek starcza jeden długopis. Nie? Znowu, to też zależy od tego, jak wygląda ten, ten podpis. Zaraz wam pokażę jeszcze jeden film. Nick, uh, quick info for you. Um, I used 14 pencils, uh, pen, pens uh, f, uh, to, to sign a book, so it's to sign all, all, all of those books, yeah, basically. So, um, I'm, I'm, można powiedzieć, że jestem testerem uh, długopisów, nie? w sensie takim już wiem, które są dobre uh, do tego procesu. Okay, let's go to the next one. And, oczywiście w trakcie, jak um, te książki były podpisywane, to mieliśmy kupę zabawy i, że tak powiem, Imker, który jest firmą logistyczną, która obsługuje dla mnie i magazynowanie, i pakowanie, i wysyłanie tych wszystkich książek, yy, kręci też sobie takie, no, TikToki, tak, w sensie, i wygląda to mniej więcej tak, poczekajcie chwilkę. No, więc. <laughs> uh, um, Nick, uh, this music was uh, from a, a cartoon movie, Rexio. 
Uh, it was a. Um... Okay, 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 okay. I don't hear the music. Okay, so was it playing was for you? I didn't hear it. So. Okay, 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 okay. There was no, no music. Wy też pewnie nie słyszeliście muzyki, ale generalnie w tle była muzyka z uh, filmu Rexio. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's go then. Um... Co jeszcze? Wysyłka. Tak? Następny etap to jest wysyłka oczywiście, czyli ten moment, w którym yy, książki po podpisaniu są pakowane i wysyłane do Was, więc pokażę znowu, yy, pokażę znowu jak to pakowanie wyglądało. E, kurczę, pewnie też nie słyszycie tego. A nie, był dźwięk u Was. Dobrze. To jeżeli u Was jest dźwięk, to jest super. Dziewczyny robią to naprawdę, naprawdę sprawnie. Chyba nawet sprawniej niż ja podpisuję, tak jakby się dobrze zastanowić. Ja no może trochę wolniej. I tak wyglądają gotowe i spakowane książki, które są gotowe do wysyłki, tak? Czyli palety książek, gdzie książki są już spakowane. No jak widzicie, tutaj są akurat pojedyncze, później są pakowane również pakiety. Większość zamówień jest na pojedyncze książki, więc jakby łatwo można to ogarnąć, ale później trzeba nakleić na to etykiety do wysyłki książki, tak? Więc jakby proces drukowania kilku tysięcy etykiet to też jest całkiem zabawne, yy, yy, zabawne widowisko. Uh, um, Nick, those are the labels for, you know, uh, FedEx and so on, yeah? And so uh, few thousands of them, basically. <laughs> and they have to be uh, sticked to, to the packages. Okay, so... Uh, tak to wyglądało i teraz nie przesadzę, jeżeli powiem, że firmy kurierskie w tych moment, w tych godzinach, w których one przyjeżdżają, dosłownie ustawiały się w kolejkę. Tak? Czyli mamy Orlen Paczkę, która zabiera e, przesyłki, e, mamy Imposta, który zabiera przesyłki, mieliśmy jeszcze FedExa, który zabiera przesyłki, mniejsze, większe samochody, do których rzeczywiście te książki były ładowane. To, czego możecie nie wiedzieć, ale pewnie wiecie, bo składając zamówienie widzieliście, że tam jest taka opcja opakowanie prezentowe. Książki można również spakować na prezent, czyli my pakujemy, ta paczka wygląda w taki sposób i później jest to pakowane w karton i w takiej formie dostarczane do Was. Także jeżeli ktoś chce zrobić komuś prezent z książką po prostu kupuj, czy z książką finansową Ninja, czy z zaufaniem, tak jak najbardziej taka możliwość istnieje. We'll have a Christmas time, yeah? Nick, and so this is the, you know, gift, uh, packa packa packaging, <laughs> packaging, oh my gosh, uh, I will drink. A, troszkę nawodnić gardło alkohol, wysusza akurat, to jest problem. E, no i tak, ostatni etap to jest książka, która trafia do Was. E, e, udało mi się dotrzymać terminu w tym sensie, że zakładaliśmy, że do piątku maksymalnie wyślemy wszystkie oczekujące zamówienia, Udało nam się to zrobić do czwartku, także jest wysoka szansa, że większość z Was już dzisiaj e, książki u siebie ma, e, ja moją mam oczywiście. E, e, w tej chwili jest tak, że o ile nie przekroczyliśmy 10 tysięcy, a zaraz się dowiemy, czy przekroczyliśmy, czy nie, to jeżeli nie przekroczyliśmy 10 tysięcy, to wszystkie zamówienia obsługujemy na bieżąco, tak? czyli w kolejnym dniu roboczym po prostu je wyślemy. Książki do Was docierają, widzę już w social mediach zdjęcia, tych książek, które gdzieś tam wrzucacie, pokazujecie, że już je macie, że już są, chwalicie się tymi kolorami stempelków. Powiem szczerze, to jest dokładnie to, to jest ten moment, który mnie najbardziej cieszy, bo widzę, że cała ta praca, która została wykonana gdzieś tam w tle, no ona się materializuje, tak, i macie ten, jakby dochodzimy do tego, znaczy jesteście w tym samym momencie, w którym byłem ja jakiś czas temu, jak czytałem po prostu kupuj, które przyszło z drukarni i pierwszy raz kartkowałem i rzeczywiście czytałem, tak? Także jak najbardziej cieszę się, że dajecie znać. To zresztą też pomaga, nie oszukujmy się, pomaga sprzedaży, promocji książki, tak? Ja nie sprzedaję, ja nie, ja nie stosuję żadnych narzędzi takich promocyjnych, powiedziałbym płatnych. Postanowiłem, że wszystko przy po prostu kupuje się będzie odbywało póki co totalnie organicznie i tak dokładnie jest, tak? Być może kiedyś reklamować tą książkę będę, ale na razie, że tak powiem, zakładam, że jest to na tyle dobra książka, że reklamować jej nie trzeba, bo najskuteczniejszym sposobem jej promowania będziecie wy sami, nie? jakkolwiek by to nie brzmiało. No ja oczywiście też się staram do tego dokładać. Nick, those are the first uh, photos that people are putting on the social media. I just have taken few of them from Twitter. Yeah? And uh, I'm really happy that people are sharing the, uh, the happiness of, 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 of uh, getting uh, their own copy of the book. Okay. Um, 
let's go. Okej, okay. przypominam, że do, to już powiedziałem, że to no nie będę się powtarzał. Strona jest totalnie oczywista, czyli po prostu kupuj.pl. Ja to, co bym chciał wam pokazać na tej stronie, może zróbmy, to później wam pokażę. Generalnie macie tam podane powody, dla których warto książkę kupić, tak? Czyli e, przypominam, że nie tylko macie niższą cenę w chwili obecnej, ale również macie, e, ale również macie e, e, zniżkę na zakup e-booka i audiobooka. Czytaj, wszystkie osoby, które kupią przez sprzedaży, będą mogły kupić e-booka i audiobooka taniej, tak jakby kupowały pakiet tak naprawdę e, teraz, ale tego pakietu póki co nie ma, ja nie chcę też brać od was pieniędzy z góry, więc tak sobie wymyśliłem a, i tak to zrobiłem, że po prostu korzystając z tego samego, e, podając przy zamawianiu ten sam adres e-mail, przy który, z którego zamawialiście książkę, będziecie mieli automatycznie nałożoną zniżkę na e-booka czy audiobooka, o ile będziecie chcieli je kupić. One się ukażą w pierwszej połowie przyszłego roku. Dla jasności obie wersje cyfrowe chcę wypuścić w tym samym momencie. Na chwilę obecną pracę nad audiobookiem jeszcze nie rozpocząłem, więc tak naprawdę daty dzisiaj takiej dokładnej wam podać nie potrafię. No ale chcę, żeby przed wakacjami to wszystko, najpóźniej przed wakacjami, żeby to wszystko po prostu było gotowe i dostępne do sprzedaży. Myślę, że audiobook będzie bardzo fajnym tutaj takim, powiedziałbym, bonusem dla was, w tym sensie, że audiobook jest, będzie nagrywany przeze mnie, nie? czyli jeżeli komuś brakuje moich podcastów, no to, że tak powiem, dostanie w książkę w wersji audio, w sensie będzie mógł kupić książkę w wersji audio um, i do książki w wersji audio będzie też taki mały e-book, gdzie będą wszystkie wykresy, tabele i tak dalej, żeby, żeby po prostu jednak była jakość czytania tej książki, w sensie słuchania tej książki, była taka, żeby to doznanie było pełne, w tym sensie, że możecie również spojrzeć w te wszystkie wykresy, które w książce były opublikowane, one są niestety istotną częścią tej książki, niestety, niestety, i super. Dobra. Myślę, że to jest ten moment, w którym możemy przejść do Q&A. Nick, I will unmute you. I will switch our sides. So you are main guest today. And uh, I have some comments already start. So I, uh, I will start to read them. Yeah. Let's do it. Um, Wiki Photos. Hi, Nick and uh, Michał. Thanks for the great book. I've listened to the original on oh. Audible, but I'm looking forward to reading the Polish expanded version as well. Or this, okay, it, that's not a question, but still, nice comment. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Wiki Photos. <laughs> Thank you. <yeah. laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. No, I'm practicing. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Majuli, you are very good in Polish language. Uh, We'll, we'll train before coming to Poland next year. Oh, so yes, we, we should. We you, should. You, you will be able to <laughs> deliver the presentation in Polish. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. I wish. <laughs> uh, there, there is a... Um, tu, 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 um, okay, the, people are asking whether do we have already 10,000 uh, uh, copies sold. Uh, I will show you. I will show you the current uh, results. Just we're wait close. a sec. We're gonna be now. We're gonna probably a little under, but close. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> you haven't checked. <laughs> I I haven't checked. But I will. No, show but you... I've been. Uh, I'm such a data person. I track, and so every time you give an update, I've been tracking, and so like I I think we're a little under. Uh, okay. Okay. So 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 you have probably the the the, the curve <laughs> that is that is drawing, and you already know yeah, the number. Yeah. Like it was yeah. like this much, then so, seven, then this. So we're close. So, but so Nick, we're... please please tell me what is the current number, and we'll check. Oh my guess. Okay, I'm I'm guessing it's ninety two hundred nine thousand two hundred. Okay, okay, okay. Let's let's check it out. Let's check it out. Uh, I'm adding uh, my sales system to the screen right now. So basically, what it does, I will hide the comment. What it does, uh, it shows the. Um, I will switch to Polish. Um, tutaj widzicie tak naprawdę. Um, uh, Liczbę egzemplarzy sprzedanych od 2 października, no po prostu tak zawęziłem, sprzedaż jest od 30 października do 1 grudnia, czyli do daty, która jeszcze nie nastąpiła i mamy trzy warianty książki, tak? Mamy samą książkę, mamy dwa egzemplarze książki, czyli musimy tą pozycję później dodać do całkowitej liczby sprzedaży, bo to jest tak naprawdę, to są dwa egzemplarze książki i mamy pakiet po prostu kupu i finansowego ninja. Klikam search, o, oh, not the screen, klikam search. Okay, and now we got it. So it's seven. Uh, to jest 7914. I musimy do tego dodać. 
1343. Okay, Nick, so number, so current number, Nick, is... You were right, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 57, 92, yeah, 57. Yeah, yeah. 9,257 yeah. copies. Oh, God, I'm so <laughs> close. <laughs> tell you, I'm telling you math, man, the numbers, I'm a numbers guy. <laughs> yeah, and um, uh, let's let's see if orders are coming, yeah? So basically, I search again. Uh, no, 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 no. At the moment, we have, uh, we, we stick to that. So basically, jeżeli chcecie zamówić książkę, to w, uh, czujcie się, że tak powiem, uh, <laughs> zaproszeni do tego. Okay, let's let's get back. So, uh, to... so close. <laughs> so close, so close. Um, um, so, we have something like 700 uh, copies left right now from the first print. Mamy jakieś 700 egzemplarzy z pierwszego nakładu, 700... Bo wiecie, ja ze sobą przywiozłem całkiem dużo książek do domu też, z tego tam 10 tysięcy. 10 450 było wydrukowane, 200 było uszkodzone, 200 nie podpisałem, czyli no tak, zostało powiedzmy około 600 kopii, bo ja mam parę pudełek tutaj u siebie w domu również. 600 yeah, copies. Can I share something? Can I share yeah, something? Sure. So yeah. in the US, do you want to guess how many pre yeah. guess how many pre-orders I had? And trust me, don't don't guess as high, guess low. Okay, guess okay. How many pre-orders I had Uwaga. in the United States? I will translate that. Uh, słuchajcie, Nick pyta, zgadnijcie, ile on miał uh, egzemplarzy w przedsprzedaży w Stanach Zjednoczonych. I ten numer jest raczej niski. W, tak, tak uprzedził. Więc śmiało piszcie teraz na czacie, ile egzemplarzy według was Nick sprzedał w ramach przedsprzedaży w Stanach Zjednoczonych. Nick, tell me, how long was the pre-order period in the United States? Uh, six months. Uh, September to April. So a little over six months, I think. Okay. 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 Seven months. Uh, czyli około sześciu miesięcy trwała przedsprzedaż w Stanach Zjednoczonych. Uh, they, they also, they weren't signed. There was no yeah. stamps, right? So... Nick, do you see comments or not? People uh, sure. comment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can see the number. Do you want, can I tell you the number? <laughs> yes, please do. Please do. 1700. That was it. 1700 egzemplarzy. 1700 egzemplarzy przed sprzedaży w Stanach Zjednoczonych. Uh, At the end of the first week, though, we had 10,000. So, like, I mean, sold. But once okay. it released, a lot more came out. So I had 10,000 at the end of the first week, but we did not have that many pre-orders. You've crushed it, absolutely. <laughs> not even close. <laughs> okay, okay. That's, that's, that's nice to hear, really. That's nice to hear. Uh, basically, I um, I think that uh, in Poland uh, the uh, the effect will be completely different than in in US. So basically, we'll probably have huge pre-orders, and then when the price increases a bit and there is no promotion, I mean uh, no promotional packages, uh, uh, the the sales will probably uh, flatten and lag. Yeah, and uh, but we'll see. We'll see. Basically, uh, anyway, uh, almost ten thousand copies is huge number basically for pre-order yeah it's amazing it's great it's 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 really good you did such a great job and i also think it's because you have such a brand like i wasn't known i've never written a book you've written a book you've written multiple books actually so like this is not your first time doing this you you're like locked in you know what you're doing i you know i was a first timer i just going on podcasts you did everything like perfectly so that's it's really a testament to the work you've done so thank honestly you. honestly i was very very unafraid and unsure what the result will be because uh, I stopped blogging a year ago, basically. Okay, so I I, I said to my audience that uh, I was blogging for 10 years and this is my retirement time, basically. Probably I will write something from time to time, but not as on, the, on a regular schedule, yeah? And uh, so I was afraid and then uh, I, I, I had a very huge gap between the books. So basically my last book went uh, live uh, in 2019, so basically five years ago, yeah, uh, uh, 2018, 18, uh, five years ago. Uh, and honestly, when I'm talking about f when, when I'm recalling the financial ninja results, which was and still is my most popular book right now, um, it sold during pre order uh, 12,000 copies, but not that fast. I mean, it was. Uh, pre-order uh, was two months, basically. Yeah, and we did it in I don't know, two weeks or three weeks, basically. Yeah, right now, crazy, crazy. Uh, that's really nice. 
Okay, uh, so let's back uh, to the questions um, we already have. Um, uh, choo -choo 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 -choo. I will show the questions, not comments. Uh, do not waste your time. Okay. Uh, Adam says, I just got a book uh, by uh, delivery today. Part about the biggest lie in personal finance and the inflation of life. Uh, Vanderbilt family case is amazing. Reading book and listen. Uh, read, reading book and listen to both of you. Okay, great. Uh, that's uh, that's nice. Uh, definitely. Jeżeli ktoś nie wie, co to za historia, to polecam sięgnąć uh, po książkę. Mamy pytanie. We have a question. Bartos asks, uh, what Nick thinks uh, uh, about investing in um, in more risky uh, instruments uh, for young people, uh, 25 years. Um, uh, he's talking about, about the portfolio uh, in uh, stocks, uh, for example, ETFs, A SCHD and uh, QQQM, so uh, Schwab's uh, dividend uh, um, ETF and uh, NASDAQ, um, and uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, because we have more time, I mean, those young people yeah we have more time to the to the um, to our retirement so basically what do you think about uh, taking more risk uh, in young age yeah i mean you can definitely do it um i don't think it matters as much as you think especially early it doesn't matter because like you're not going to have I mean, as if you're young i'm assuming you don't have a lot of money right if you already have a lot of money that's a very different situation maybe you have parents that give you money whatever but like if you don't have a lot of money it doesn't the risk you take doesn't matter all that much. What matters more is like, how much can you save, right? Like, can you put more money aside? Right? And that's kind of what, you know, just keep buying talks about. So um, in terms of this case, like, I don't think it mat your allocation matters as much. I do think this would, it's good. I think it's good in the sense of if this portfolio is too risky, you're going to find out real quick. You're going to find out within a few years. If you went through COVID with that, with SHD, QQQM, B Bitcoin, Ethereum, you go through that. Um, you're going to realize real quick if that's right for you or not. So I'll let you translate if you want for them. Yeah. So Bartosz, nie wiem, czy zrozumiałeś, czy nie, ale generalnie nie ma problemu w podejmowaniu ryzyka, jak się jest osobą dosyć młodą, dlatego że prawdopodobnie nie dysponujesz jako osoba młoda. Mówimy o typowym scenariuszu, jeżeli nie odziedziczyłeś majątku, a nie masz od rodziców cokolwiek, albo po prostu nie prowadzisz jakiejś swojej firmy, która generuje ci duże nadwyżki finansowe, to raczej jako młoda osoba nie dysponujesz tak dużym majątkiem, jak osoby, które są starsze. W związku z tym to, czy bierzesz na siebie większe ryzyko, czy nie, nie ma większego znaczenia. Tak? Upraszczam bardzo wypowiedź Nika, ale generalnie co do zasady się z tym zgadzam. W ogóle w książce jest, I will, I will give example from the book. W książce jest taki przykład, dla kogo jest w ogóle inwestowanie, tak? I jest taki przykład, w sensie na samym początku książki w zasadzie jest powiedziane, że inwestowanie jest bogatych, a oszczędzanie jest dla biednych i jakby trudno się nie zgodzić z tym stwierdzeniem, bo często, gęsto młodzi inwestorzy zastanawiają się nad tym, jak tutaj poprawić swoją stopę zwrotu o kolejne tam trzy punkty procentowe, tak naprawdę mają w swoim portfelu inwestycyjnym 10 tysięcy złotych i te trzy punkty procentowe w skali roku znaczą dużo, dużo mniej niż jedno wyjście na miasto i, i po prostu puszczenie rachunku gdzieś tam w, w jakimś barze, tak? Więc y, y, nie ma co też, y, powiedziałbym, nadmiernie tracić na to czasu, żeby się zastanawiać, jak tutaj różne rzeczy optymalizować, raczej zbierać doświadczenie w młodym wieku, czyli patrzeć, w jaki sposób reaguje się również na, na to, co się w tym portfelu dzieje. Właśnie w takich sytuacjach, o których nikt mówił, czyli na przykład spadki w trakcie COVID-a, bo to jest bardzo dobra lekcja tak? dla nas, czy my tak naprawdę ten poziom ryzyka, który w portfelu mamy, akceptujemy czy nie, bo może się okazać, że wcale go nie akceptujemy i wtedy możemy stopniowo to ryzyko po prostu próbować obniżać, czy no po prostu adresować, tak, w jakiś tam sposób. Um, dobra. Um, uh, very good question. Nick, how to convince wife into investing? Investing in, in what, I guess, is the question. <laughs> <laughs> Lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, what, what, I guess the question is, like, if you're trying to con you're trying to convince her to do like a you know a prudent approach to investing, I mean, I, I think you just have to get her involved. Have her like I know it's not as interesting to every person. Not not everyone. This is not even male female you know husband wife yeah. thing. It's just not everyone's as in, as interested in investing. But you have to just tell her about it. like 
relate it back to things that that they care about. So if it's like, hey, do you like traveling? Like, well, we could pay for our trips or you could even get into like retirement things or hey, if we save enough money, we could pay for our lifestyle. All those things are going to be ways you have to you have to translate it from this mathematical thing that you and I and, and Michel, we all love. And you have to translate to something that makes more sense that actually is valued by her. So find those things and say, like, make that connection. So that's what I would say. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I have another question that is related and addressed to me. So basically, I will try to to answer that. Uh, Adam asks, uh, 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 Michael, how do you convince your wife to investing? Uh, <laughs> uh, I will address that in Polish. Um, słuchajcie, no, to nie jest tak, że ja przekonałem moją żonę do inwestowania. Ja nie przekonałem do stylu inwestowania, który ja uprawiam. To, co jest istotne w tym naszym inwestowaniu, to, że Gabi ma bardzo duże zaufanie do mnie, jeżeli chodzi o, o to, że ja podejmuję mądre decyzje. Tak? Teraz, czy to jest prawda, czy nie, to się oczywiście okaże w czasie, nie? Ale so far so good, jak mówią Indianie, nie? Uh, Nick, uh, I basically said that uh, I haven't convinced my wife to invest in. She basically <laughs> trusts me. Yeah? And uh, um, uh, mówiąc dalej, generalnie jest tak, że ja przygotowałem, Gabi ma przygotowany zestaw wytycznych, tak jak kiedyś Warren Buffett dla swojej żony przygotował zestaw wytycznych, w jaki sposób ona powinna inwestować po jego odejściu ich majątek, to ja mam podobny zestaw wytycznych też przygotowany do mo dla mojej żony. Tak? I między innymi moje inwestycje w Finaxie, czyli u robodoradcy, co możecie powiedzieć z jednej strony, no to nie jest efektywne, bo u robodoradcy są opłaty i tak dalej, lepiej byś wyszedł na tym, gdybyś inwestował sam. Tak, z jednej strony to jest wszystko prawda, ale z drugiej strony ja muszę w jakiś sposób za mojego życia pokazać też mojej żonie i moim dzieciom, że inwestowanie może być w pełni automatyczne i też może generować w dłuższym horyzoncie czasowym fajne stopy zwrotu. Nie da się tego pokazać w inny sposób niż pokazując to na przykładzie. Tak, bo bardzo trudno jest osobie, która nie inwestuje, uwierzyć w to, że to w ogóle jest możliwe, że ktoś będzie za was inwestował wasz kapitał w zautomatyzowany sposób. To jest trudne, mentalnie to jest trudne do udźwignięcia, zwłaszcza dla takich osób, które są asekuracyjne. Uh, Nick Shorty, I also uh, gave an example that uh, besides uh, investing uh, on my own, I also use robo advisor. Why? Um, there are, of course, fees I ha are higher than uh, my own investing. But on the other end, I'm able to show to my family that investing could be fully automated uh, and it could give in the longer term satisfact satisfactory results, basically. Yeah. So it doesn't mean, matter for me whether it will be one percentage point higher or not or, or lower. Yeah. I mean, in, in that part of the portfolio. Why? Because it addresses different requirements, my requirements. Yeah. Uh, I want to prove to my family that uh, they don't have to invest like me. I, I'm an active investor uh, mostly. Yeah. I select stocks and so on. So I go um, a different way than uh, described in the book itself. Of course, um, around 40% of my portfolio are ETFs. Yeah. But still most of the portfolio are in individual stocks. So, so This is the way of investing that my family really can't follow. And uh, that's it. Yeah. So I mm -hmm. have to give them another examples. And uh, honestly, translating uh, uh, just keep buying into Polish was my way of uh, um, actually the first uh, gifts I will give to my family uh, is a few copies of this book. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> it, shows, it shows how to invest easily. Yeah, that's it. So wracając, jeden z powodów, dla którego przetłumaczyłem Just Keep Buying na polski, to po prostu nie chciałem, żeby inny wydawca skopał to tłumaczenie, mówiąc już tak zupełnie wprost. Przetłumaczyłem w taki sposób, żeby moje dzieci, moja żona przeczytały tę książkę i rozumiały, dlaczego inwestować powinny. Powinni, tak? Ogólnie rzecz biorąc. Dobra, next question. Let's do it. Uh, Paweł. Paweł asks. Um, uh, I will translate the question. Um, It's interesting that Nick and uh, Michał talk about uh, just keep buying and both of them are speculating. Um, he probably asked this question before uh, you said, how do you invest? Uh, but he says that Nick is um, working for the investment company and uh, Mike, uh, Michał uh, have a portfolio of American stocks. Yeah. So uh, first of all, uh, I would uh, disagree uh, in part. 
Oh, I will let address this question to uh, this comment by you first, and then I will comment in Polish. Uh, so what does he mean speculating? Like how I don't like I work for an investment firm and we actually hold most of our funds are ETFs. We hold it's we don't hold individual positions. It's all 100% ETFs. We do have a tactical strategy, but that is like that's going from one ETF to another. It's kind of doing allocation. Like a, yeah, yeah. It'll be an okay. allocation change mm -hmm. from like bond to stock. Right. But out, outside of that, no, 100% ETFs were 100% passive. So there's no oh. Define speculating. I mean, what what does that mean to you? I just want to. My understanding that is not what that means, but yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I I, I was supposed to say the the same. Uh, I will switch to Polish and then translate for you. So basically, uh, uh, słuchajcie, spekulowanie z mojej perspektywy to jest po prostu uprawianie czegoś takiego, że krótkoterminowo próbujemy zarobić na giełdzie. Ja nie uprawiam spekulacji. Tak? Ja kupuję papiery długoterminowo do mojego portfela. Oczywiście czasami zdaję sobie sprawę, że fakty się zmieniają. I wtedy, kiedy fakty się zmieniają, ja również zmieniam moją decyzję dotyczącą trzymania na przykład danej pozycji w portfelu. Bardzo prosty przykład, jeżeli spółka dywidendowa, którą kupiłem w celu otrzymywania tej dywidendy, nagle zawiesza tą dywidendę, redukuje, przestaje płacić, cokolwiek, to oznacza, że zmieniły się fakty, które jakby miały wpływ na moją decyzję o włożeniu tej spółki do portfela. Ja po prostu często gęsto taką spółkę wtedy z portfela wyrzucam, sprzedaję ją, czy to z zyskiem, czy ze stratą, zastępuję ją innymi pozycjami, tak? A więc tak to wygląda z mojej perspektywy. Ja, ja powiem, że moim zdaniem ja nie uprawiam spekulacji, ja po prostu uprawiam inwestowanie długoterminowe, które niestety w niektórych przypadkach nie okazuje się inwestowaniem długoterminowym, tak? Bo fakty się zmieniają. Uh, so Nick, just for you, uh, I said that uh, I'm not speculating, I'm investing long term, but sometimes the facts change. So basically if I buy a company that uh, was supposed to pay me a dividend and uh, had a good fundamentals, and then it appears that uh, um, the company is cutting the dividend uh, or just, uh, you know, basically changes uh, it, its dividend policy or uh, uh, fundamentals change dramatically. So, and then it, I could decide if the facts change that, that I will sell the, the position. Yeah, but still my mindset and my approach to investing is long-term investing. Typically I'm buying, yeah, and holding forever. And uh, I have additional comment. I will first comment in Polish. Uh, druga rzecz, która jest istotna z mojej perspektywy, to jest to, że ja staram się zbudować taki portfel, w, w którym pozycji nie będę musiał sprzedawać, że być może te pozycje zostaną odziedziczone przez moje dzieci, tak, czy no nie tylko dzieci, tak, w sensie tych, którzy mają je otrzymać. Um, bo ja buduję portfel, który mi płaci dywidendy. Ja wiem, że jakby w Polsce jest taka mantra, że kupujmy akumulujące ETF-y, bo one nas dobrze chronią podatkowo i tak dalej. Z drugiej strony ja wolę otrzymywać dywidendę, bo wtedy nie muszę podejmować decyzji na temat sprzedaży momentu, w którym chcę sprzedawać pojedyncze pozycje. Tak? Wręcz przeciwnie, otrzymuję tak duży strumień dywidend, że w zasadzie nigdy nie muszę sprzedawać niczego z portfela, tak? bo dywidendy dzisiaj z nawiązką pokrywają, dywidendy stanowią mniej więcej dwukrotność moich kosztów życia, te dywidendy, które otrzymuję rocznie. And then, uh, <laughs> dobra, przełączę się na angielski i powiem to Nikowi, tak? Nick, uh, basically I said that um, I do have dividend stocks in my portfolio and the reason for holding dividend stocks and not accumulating ETFs, for example, because in Europe you can have accumulating dividend, uh, ETFs that uh, do not pay dividends, but accumulate them and reinvest. So it's, uh, I would say, those are tax optimized uh, uh, ETFs uh, from the uh, European perspective. Yeah, uh, But still, I prefer dividend ETFs. Why? Because uh, I, um, the, the whole cash flow from dividends finances my life. So basically, uh, Thanks to that, and thanks, uh, I, I have a mental a mentality that allows me to buy stocks with the intention to hold them forever and don't sell at any any point in time because uh, I'm living off dividends, and that's that's my idea of building of the portfolio. Of course, if I would have uh, huge expenses, for example, some health crisis or I don't know some needs, uh, huge needs, then of course I will sell some positions, but still. Uh, the the uh, approach is to invest long term. Yeah. Okay. Uh, spróbuję wyłuskać takie pytania, które są do Nika. Uh, słuchajcie, żeby żeby też Nick mógł tutaj odpowiedzieć. Uh, Nick, there is a question if you know about dividend kings in Seeking Alpha and what do you think about them? I so I said I that you probably do you, don't know. What do you know about dividend king? I know what dividend. I think dividend kings are like the top paying dividend. No, no, stocks, no, no. no. Right? It's not. It's not about. It's not. There is a service on Seeking Alpha that is called Dividend Kings. That the guys who 
try to uh, you know do a fundamental analysis on dividend stocks and I said uh, in the comment that you probably don't know about them no yeah. I so, mean nothing against seeking alpha or <laughs> okay I don't. Yeah, Remember, yeah I'm yeah. trying to do I'm trying to do long-term diversified like I don't hold individual stocks so I'm not looking at that exactly exactly you 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 do have a portfolio of ETFs yep okay let's do it um uh, to do there was a question what kind of stocks do you have in in uh, your portfolio um uh, nick doesn't have uh, individual companies we said it we said that already uh okay that's I mean, i'm just that's doing diversified question. so i like i have like the s p 500 us i'll have some small some value i have emerging market i have developed and then i have reits which is separate like uh, us mm -hmm. real estate that's it. yeah so it's like those are the seven buckets but yeah nice nice uh, uh tomas asks the question uh, you can read it and uh, just address it how did i start i started with i mean it's in the book kind of i started when i was 23 i just started buying uh at my first job out of college and i you know i didn't know exactly i was i was kind of going crazy in my head like do i do like 15 percent bond or 20 percent bond or i didn't know and i just bought yeah, uh, most I just bought ETFs and index funds, right? And of course, of course, on along the way, I bought a handful. I bought, I've owned four individual stocks in my life. I've owned two, and then I sold those. And then in the tech, in the in the twenty twenty one, I bought two more, and I sold them. But those ones I sold for a big loss. The first two I bought, I basically bought and sold, and never lost any money. I just like lost. I should have owned the S and P, made more, but like. I didn't lose any money. And then the, the tech ones, I lost money because it was, it was the time in 2021. Everything was going up so much that everyone's like, hey, take a little bit of money and try. And so I played the lottery and lost, you know, and so it is what it is. I don't, you know, do I regret it? Not really, because I've learned a lesson that's I'm going to keep with me. It's going to save me, you know, tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars in the future. So that's that's in the future. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm always uh, telling that uh, probably the first mistakes uh, should always be treated as as the um, college fee. I would say uh, the, the, in the same way you pay to get the education. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, okay, the next question. Uh, and that's the tricky one, but I will show it. Uh, the psychology of money, or just keep buying. Which book I should read first? Read first psychology of money for sure i Definitely. i think it's a it's a it, it's a more entertaining book it's got amazing stories morgan's the best writer in finance i will say that he's my mentor he's like taught i wouldn't be here without him so like he's taught me so much it's a good way to look at behavior and see like how does behavior work and then it's like okay well where's the evidence show related to the behavior because my only my and i want to say what a gripe i have with Morgan, but my only like kind of pushback on his thinking and his philosophy is like can we prove a lot of the stuff? Some of it makes sense. It can make sense logically, but it doesn't mean it's true, right? It doesn't mean that we can prove it, right? So it's really hard to show mindset. It's really hard to show certain things, right? For example, I have no evidence from my personal life that the earth is, is a sphere. A every time I've been in an airplane, it looks flat, right? But we know, <laughs> I mean, we can do experiments and all that. We, can, we know the earth is round, but my personal experience does not validate that whatsoever. And so I think that's the same thing with a lot of behavioral investing stuff. It's like, well, that makes sense, but it, just because it makes sense doesn't mean it's true. And so I like to look at data. And so like one of the things I, I talked about in, in Just Keep Buying was, you know, income is the most important thing in terms of your savings rate. Like if you look at like the correlations, like exactly. the higher your income, the more you can save. And it's like, it's obvious, like it's no, no, like for people in America, it's like, no shit, Nick, like it's obvious, very obvious stuff, right? It's like that, that should be, you know, if I have more money, it's easier to save it, right? I don't have to spend it, right? And so, but a lot of people say, when you cut your spending, it's your behavior, it's your mindset. It's like, no, it's your income. Income is probably the thing. And so that's the thing I would say is like psychology money is great, incredible book, one of the best written books you'll ever read. You know, it's just literally, he, he's like the Mozart of writing in, in finance. Um, read that first, kind of get the behavior stuff and then look at what the data says as well. And then kind of, you have to kind of pick and, you know, pick and choose how much of each each of these things matter. Exactly, exactly. I fully agree. Actually, the psychology of money was the, the first book I was giving uh, 
uh, in huge numbers to my friends, basically. And uh, now I said to myself that I will give either two books or just the second one because <laughs> they already have the psychology of money. Yeah, but uh, it's it's a perfect combination, I, I think. And definitely, psychology of money should be read first because that's the foundation for, I would say, say uh, mental traps and uh, behavior stuff. Yeah? Uh, Okie dokie. Uh, let's get to the next question. Uh, that's the tricky one. Uh, that's the 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 question about. Um, oh, mm, uh, that's the question whether the promoters of uh, ETF investing or passive investing in general uh, are not afraid that the most of the uh, turnover of uh, stock exchanges will come from strategies like buy and hold uh, for 30 years, for example. Yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, that's that's uh, the question really about the comparison of uh, active investing versus passive investing and to whether we are not afraid that I, whether we as the passive investors are not afraid that uh, this will somehow uh, affect the market in general, that there are so many passive investors. Yeah, so this has been debated a lot. Um, on there's something called the Bogleheads forum, Vanguard, the Bogleheads, yeah. Jack Bogle. They've debated this. This question has been asked so many times. It's been debated to death. As far as I know, there is zero, no evidence that we've gotten to that point or anywhere near the point where there's so much passive investors that the markets are inefficient and it causes all sorts of issues. I just don't think it's there. And I think because there's, there's still active investors, there's so many active investors and they have money and they're going to they're going to affect markets. And so I think as long as someone believes they can beat the market, markets will stay efficient. I think it could even be, I, I personally believe it could be 90% passive, 10% active, the entire market, and it would still be efficient. I still think people think that's kind of crazy. say, no, that's way too much. I think 10% active and the markets are efficient. That's my take. So I don't know if, how you want to yeah. translate. but yeah, yeah, yeah. I will comment on that too, because I was analyzing the topic. And basically, uh, it's important to understand when there is an ETF creation. And uh, most of the trans transactions on the ETF market, they does not create uh, new ETFs, basically, because uh, the, uh, they are not touching the market. They are just, just being, the ETFs uh, are being traded. I mean, uh, the, the individual, uh, uh, how, how do you say, jednostki in Polish. Jeżeli obracacie jednostkami, I will switch to Polish. Uh, jeżeli obracacie jednostkami ETF-ów, to tak naprawdę emitent ETF-a nie musi kreować nowych jednostek w większości. Przy, w przypadku większości transakcji. On nie kupuje tych akcji, które są pod spodem. Dlaczego? Dlatego, że większość obrotu odbywa się pomiędzy posiadaczami tych ETF-ów. Jedna osoba sprzedaje jednostki ETF-ów, druga osoba kupuje jednostki ETF-ów i to nie wymusza transakcji na rynku pod spodem, że emitent ETF-a musi kupić na przykład akcje Apple'a, Microsoftu, Google'a i tak dalej. That's what I said, that uh, the, the ETF transactions between buyer and seller typically don't uh, touch the market uh, in case of the underlying securities, uh, uh, because uh, most most of the... You have to really, uh, yeah. You have to understand yeah. the share mechanism, how it works exactly. and how they're trading these baskets. And it, it doesn't impact the market that much unless there's really, I mean, it, it there have been cases where, you know, you see ETFs that are... shoot down and shoot back up, but yeah. they're very rare. And those are rare circumstances, but I agree. Of course, there are inflows to the ETFs, and then uh, emittents have to buy uh, uh, has to buy securities. Yeah, but but still, most of the most of the transactions doesn't really touch the underlying securities. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, let's go to the other to the next question. Mm. <laughs> that's that's a tricky one. Uh, the question is uh, 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 to Nick uh, and to me. Uh, whether I have explained to you how the Polish retirement um, accounts really work. Uh, I've sent you the chapter. I don't know if you have read it or not. The chapter 19 translated into English. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't read it yet. I'm going to, though. Okay. It's on my to-do okay. list. Okay, you yeah. got you it. Sent you it got it. Re you sent it recently. <laughs> yeah, I haven't had much time. So, yeah, I mean, I have to, yeah. I have to sit and look through no it. Problem. Yeah. No problem, no problem. Because the question was, uh, how do you compare the Polish uh, retirement accounts versus uh, 401k 
uh, in the United States. I can say from my perspective, uh, um, if you want. Uh, I will switch to Polish. Uh, Paweł, generalnie jest tak, że o, oczywiście te polskie programy emerytalne są w jakiś sposób wzorowane na, y, systemie, na systemach z innych krajów. PPK jest chyba najbliższe w kons swojej konstrukcji do systemu brytyjskiego, tak? gdzie masz system, kto, w którym pracodawca płaca część składki, a, y, 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 czyli dopłaca się do tego, co, co, co pracownik wkłada do, do swojego portfela inwestycyjnego a, i oczywiście te, te oszczędności, nazwijmy to tak, są inwestowane na rynku gdzieś tam przez wyspecjalizowane podmioty. Tak? E, y, 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 konta 401k, one działają też podobnie tam z dokładnością na to, że nie wszystkie są indywidualne w Stanach Zjednoczonych, bo niektóre są prowadzone przez pracodawców. Ale jeżeli mówimy o korzyściach podatkowych, to różnice między IKE i IGZE w Polsce są bardzo podobne do tego, jak wyglądają konta ROF i to drugie, że tak powiem, you have ROF, uh, IRA and IRA accounts, yeah? Okay. Uh, yes. So, uh, to w, ta, w Stanach mamy konto uh, ROF, IRA i jeszcze IRA. I jakby podobne są jak IKX w Polsce. Podobne, tak? W sensie takim, że na jednych mamy preferencje podatkowe, na drugich nie. Ale to jakby, no jednak różnice uh, istnieją. Uh, Nick, could you please tell me whether uh, if you invest in uh, IRA account or uh, Roth IRA account, do you have uh, do you have the benefit of no capital uh, gains tax or or yeah. not? No, no yeah. capital gains. Okay, okay, that's it. But uh, still, in the USA, you have a uh, different uh, taxing mechanism for short-term investments and long-term investments. Yeah. In in a uh, brokerage, in after-tax yeah, yeah. money, in brokerage not, account. not IRA. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So uh, in Poland, uh, uh, for example, we do not have the difference between short-term investments and long-term investment. Basically, they are yep, taxed yep. the same. Yeah. Yep. So. so that changes. So yeah, so I'm looking through it now. So the, the individual account with ZUS, that to mm -hmm. me, the ZUS is like, Social Security in the United States, my yes. understanding, based yes. on just my mm -hmm. quick read mm -hmm. of it. Exactly. Social so Security. Zeus yeah. is like Social Security. And then the other, everything else is kind of like, it sounds like an IRA type of vehicle. Exactly. Like where the rest of your pay, I mean, there's options where you can choose to go into one or another. It sounds like that's like an IRA, but I'm looking through it now. And just, that's my initial take. So. Okay. Okay. That's okay. Zobaczmy następne pytanie. Okay. Nice comment. So I'll show it. Uh, Mogerzata says, it's amazing that listening to Nick comes as easy as reading his words in the book. Great cooperation, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Dziękuję. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. Dziękuję. <laughs> you, you said I, sound, I, I sounded like a foreign speaker speaking uh, Polish, but I try. I try. Okay. Uh, next uh, question from Alexandra. Nick, what more about inflation would you like to write in potential second edition? I would just cover, um, I think I would just talk about like what happens to your assets during inflation, during periods of high inflation in particular. I think if I had known, remember we came off of 2% inflation for 30 years, basically my whole life, like from 1990 onward, inflation was low. I mean, even probably even a little bit before that, but imagine 30 years, no inflation. And then all of a sudden inflation is now the highest it's been since the, the early eighties. So I think that is, you know, I've actually written on this. So can I share my screen or no? Of course, you can. Yeah, let me just. Uh, I stop my screen. screen. Yeah, and yeah, you can see this press works. present. Yeah, I'll be quick. So I've talked about this on my blog, how to invest your money when inflation is high. And just like this idea of like, which asset classes perform best during inflation. So these are inflation adjusted returns. You can see, I don't know if, you, if Mikhail, you want to say anything or uh, Miel, you want to say anything in Polish, you can about this, but like, these are all the real returns. Um, And in addition, like, like yeah, yeah. Okay, so to są zwroty, które otrzymujecie, ale urealnione, czyli uwzględniające inflację z poszczególnych klas aktywów, tak? Także unika na blogu znajdzie się ten, ten artykuł. Uh, ja wam później wstawię też link do tego artykułu, może tak zróbmy. Okay, let's go on. Like, look at this. Like, this is crazy. Real returns. Like, look at this. S&P 500 Re International. They're all doing, I mean, S&P 500 is kind of crazy, but still, it's like, That's that. This is what I would have done. I would have talked more about this, like what actually does well during periods of inflation. I would have talked about, you know, U.S. stocks, international stocks, REITs, basically. So that's it. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, I will switch to Polish. W nich powiedział, że więcej by mówił o tym, w jaki sposób poszczególne klasy aktywów zachowują się w okresach wysokiej inflacji, czy wyższej inflacji, tak? Bo tego w książce rzeczywiście nie ma z tej perspektywy. Jest, jest wspomniany wpływ inflacji, ale bez rozbijania tego na klasy aktywów po prostu. Więc to jest akurat dobra informacja. Uh, okay, we are waiting for the second edition then. <laughs> One day. <laughs> One day somewhere in the future, yeah. Mm. Uh, there's a general comment. Uh, I will translate that. Um, okay, maybe, maybe the, the your book uh, is selling better um, out of US because in the US people have incredible investing opportunities, and uh, the rest of the world is trying to catch catch this rabbit. Yeah, basically. So they are trying to get the knowledge how to invest better. Maybe. There's Maybe. more people. Yeah, there's more bloggers, right? There's more people writing about it. There's more, you know, definitely, like... definitely. And actually, the the outside of the US is a bigger part of the world. Yeah. <laughs> How many Americans? I mean, well, half the, here's, here's why I say this, like half the capital markets are the US, the yeah. other half's everything else, right? So yeah, you exactly. assume that let's just do based on capital, half my sale should be in the US, but it's not. I've only I've sold like 51,000 no. in the US. I've sold 120 everywhere else, so it's not 50-50. Exactly. That's what's interesting. Uh, there are something like 400 million Americans, millions Americans. How many? Th yeah, uh, something maybe like that. 350, 350. Free, 350, 350, something like that. Yeah. So, so basically, the rest of the world is way, 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 way bigger. Of course, not that uh, invest, not so many people probably have uh, investing opportunities. I mean, uh, uh, capability, investing capability. Uh, because we are also talking about the third world, but but still, uh, even if we take into consideration the developed markets, emerging markets, uh, those biggest uh, biggest ones, uh, then there's basically more people. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, that's a good question. Nick Martin asks, uh, when do you plan to stop? Just keep buying strategy and start using your capital or even sell. That's, I don't know. No clue. <laughs> honest <laughs> answer. It's That's a. It's honesty, a. He's asking guys. a. The, Ma asking a life question. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, definitely. It's like you're asking me when I'm going to retire. When I don't know yet. I don't know. Maybe I'll keep working until I'm 70. Maybe I'll. I don't know. I mean, will I? I'm. I'm guessing at some point I'm going to start selling down and using that money for different things. I mean, there's a great book called Die With Zero. Check that yes. book out. I, I wish I had read it before. I had read it after I wrote Just Keep Buying and I regret that. I kind of wish I'd read it before. I would have changed. I would have included some of the material in there. So I, mm -hmm. if you want to translate that to Polish, please do. I, think that's, I recommend yes. that book highly. So. Jest taka książka, nazywa się Śmierć z zerem na koncie. Zaraz wam ją pokażę w ogóle. Let's wait a sec. I will show it. Mm -hmm. Oh, he has that. He has that. Oh, you might have hit your camera a little, by the way. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I hit my desk <laughs> trying to reach the yeah. book. Uh, it's this book. Uh, it's in Polish already. It's called Śmierć z zerem na koncie. Die with zero. And... Uh, ta książka opisuje fajny koncept polegający na tym, że za swojego życia powinien się rozdysponować swój majątek w jakiś tam sposób, a nie pozwolić na to, żeby dopiero po śmierci ktoś go rozdysponował, nawet jakby biorąc, że tak powiem, pod uwagę wasz testament, ale to lepiej za życia, to po pierwsze, a po drugie, że sposób, znaczy inaczej, pieniądze waszym potencjalnym spadkobiercom bardziej będą potrzebne w ich młodym wieku czy młodszym wieku niż w ich późniejszym wieku, więc zakładając nawet dług, dłuższe życie, to być może wcześniej będą potrzebowali tych pieniędzy, a w późniejszym etapie życia być może już nie będą potrzebować tych pieniędzy, więc dlatego no, bardzo ciekawy koncept i Nick powiedział, że bardzo chętnie, gdyby przeczytał tą książkę zanim napisał Just Keep Buying, to bardzo chętnie niektóre um, koncepcję z tej książki by zacytował w Just Keep Buying, a tego nie zrobił, no bo po prostu czytał tą książkę później, przeczytał tą książkę później, niż sam napisał swoją. That's it. Uh, okay. 
I translated everything you said and even added some part from my <laughs> site. <laughs> okay, let's hide this comment. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is one more question. Uh, Nick, do you use the Kali criterion in your investments? Have you read Fortune's Formula and what is your opinion about that topic? Honest? Did you so start about I, it? I don't know what Fortune's formula is. I understand the Kelly criterion. I don't know what Fortune's formula is. In terms of the Kelly criterion, I don't use it. It is the right way to invest in something. However, the problem is like the payoffs are not defined. We're assuming that. Remember, the, everything the Kelly criterion is great when you're betting in like a system where the probabilities are known. Like if you're if you're betting in like roulette or blackjack or something like that, where you have some idea of what the payoff is. That's very different than investing because you don't know what the payoff is. Like the payoff's unknown. You could have a really great period, you could have a really bad period. So in general, I'm not saying you can't use it at all, but like, I mean, diversification is is essentially like built into, you know, by diversifying, you're using Kelly Criterion in a way. So I don't I the thing is it's it's really weird to talk about Kelly Criterion with investing because it's about the future. Kelly Criterion generally is like if you know what the odds are, if you say, okay, here's the bet, here are the odds then I can say, okay, given that, here's the most I should bet. Here's the optimal level to bet. That's what Kelly Criterion does, right? And I've, I've talked about this in a blog post recently as well, if if this person wants to go into that more. Yeah. Uh, um, we have nice, uh, uh, we have some more questions. On the... Yeah, let's go to the next one. Um, one. One is comment. I have no question. To be honest, I would like to express my deepest gratitude oh, to both of nice. you for making the Polish version happening. Great job. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Dziękuję bardzo. Dziękuję bardzo. Uh, uh, Agnieszka asks, uh, Nick, what, is, what was your first job? And uh, how much of the first payment have you saved? <laughs> oh, back then. Oh, wow. Uh, first job was I worked in consulting, which is uh, like it's called litigation consulting. So lawyers, legal stuff. Mm -hmm. And how much of my from my when I first started, I wasn't getting paid that much, so I didn't save that much. But over time, as my income went up, my savings rate went up as well, which is what you know the book talks about as well. It it makes perfect sense, so <laughs> you can translate that if you want. So. Okay, I think it's pretty well understood. So, okay. yeah, Nick, że tak powiem, pierwszą pracę miał w takim w konsultingu generalnie, ale związanym z usługami prawnymi, więc dużo nie zarabiał i też dużo nie oszczędzał, ale w końcu wzrosła jego pensja, w związku z tym mógł odkładać pieniądze. Uh, Edita says, Nick, you speak Polish uh, as good as, uh, as Italian. <laughs> do, you, do you speak Italian or not? No, I don't. I don't speak any Italian. So, um, <laughs> so she's right, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she is right without knowing it. Yeah, no, I've been to Italy, but I, and I do have a last name. It's Italian, but no, I, I didn't grow up with any Italian. So I know Edita, and she actually actually lives in Italy right now. So basically, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, Pavel says that uh, if uh, Nick uh, catches Polish language so fast, then uh, Michał uh, don't have to translate the books anymore. <laughs> oh, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> it's not nice going to happen. No, but no. <laughs> I, 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 even if I knew Polish, I would have you translate the book. I feel like it's you. You'll have just not a contextual knowledge that I won't have, and you'll be a better writer. So yeah, I, I will show this question because, uh, and I will hide it later. But please read it. Read it and uh, okay, I'll read it. it. And this brings. Yes, you can, even if you're a bit older. I mean, the thing is, like, I actually have a very interesting take on this. So most people say, like, hey, let's say you're starting in your 40. Like, you're like, is it hopeless? No, Nick, it's not hopeless. Nick, let, mean... me, let me say the question in Polish, okay? Okay, yeah. Okay, and then you will address it. Okay. Uh, pytanie brzmi o to, czy ktoś, kto ma krótszą perspektywę do emerytury, czyli ma na przykład 25 lat do emerytury, czyli ma na przykład 40, czy, czy no powiedzmy może nawet bliżej 50, to czy w ogóle, no jak on ma inwestować, czy jest jakiś sens w tym, żeby inwestował? I pytanie jest, jakie ma nikt tutaj wskazówki dla osób, które mają, no nie mają tych 25 lat. Okej, okay, Nick, go on. Okay, so my, my take on this is a little bit different. So even if you start a little bit later, she, uh, she said she had 25 years until retirement, right? So like, if you have 25 years, that's some time. It's not, I mean, it would be better if you had 30 or 40, et cetera years, right? The more time, the better. Um, 
But what you can do, like my take is actually very different, which is like you need to find ways to extend your life longer so you can work a little more and so you retire a little later. And you're saying, well, Nick, I don't want to do well, it's like you started late on this financial thing. So my recommendation, honestly, it's not a financial one. It's, it's exercise. It's it's get healthy and stay healthy and stay fit because that's going to do more for you. It's going to you're going to feel better anyways. This is like a not a financial thing, but you're going to feel better. And then on top of that, you're going to be able to extend your life so you can keep you can work longer. And so you'll be able to catch up by giving yourself time. And it's one of the few things out there where like, you know, every hour you exercise, like you get about four hours of time on the back. And now, of course, that doesn't scale forever. You can't just, you know, if you work, if you work out, you know, six hours a day, you'll live forever. No, that's not how that works. But like you, you can see my point, like exercising, staying fit, staying healthy, that's going to do a lot for you to kind of extend your life later. And so you'll be able to catch up and make more contributions and work longer. So that's my take. It's a different take, but it's like, how, and it's not in the book at all. It's something I came up with after. And I think it's the right way to approach this is like, Hey, I have 25 years to retirement. No, maybe you have 30 or 35 years because you're going to start exercising. And so while everyone else has 35 years and you only have 25, if you exercise, you can push that. So you're basically equivalent to them. So that's my suggestion. If you, can, if you want to translate some of that, you can. So. Tak, Nick, Nick proponuje, żeby te osoby, które mają krótki czas do emerytury, tak naprawdę skupiły się w dużym stopniu na tym, żeby uprawić swoją kondycję i być może wtedy, w wyniku tego, że na przykład ćwiczą zdrowo, się odżywiają i tak dalej, a będą w stanie pracować dłużej i zarabiać dłużej. Czytaj, jeżeli masz 25 lat do emerytury, czy 20 lat do emerytury i chcesz sobie wydłużyć tą fazę akumulacji, w której budujesz swój portfel inwestycyjny, to po prostu być może najlepszą inwestycją jest poprawa swojego, swojej kondycji i sposobu odżywiania, chociażby po to, żeby po prostu być dłużej sprawnym nie? i móc dłużej pracować i zarabiać pieniądze, czy, czy tej dłużej wkładać, czy tej opóźnić to, to przejście na emeryturę. Nick, that's interesting take, I can say. That's interesting take, really. And there's um, data for it. I, I don't want to go into it all now, but there's a ton of, of data behind it. Like exercise is like one of the most important things you can do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, one more question. Judging by the title, I assume the book is focused on accumulation phase of investing. Do you go through consumption phase, uh, safe withdrawal rate, etc., within the book? And if not, how would you approach the topic? So I, we don't go through it. We talk about selling a little bit. And if you remember, there's a whole chapter on when to sell, but we don't go into the safe withdrawal weight or any of that stuff. Um, I've actually done a lot of research on that since the book came out and I can be happy to talk about it, but basically like the 4% rule, I, I do talk about that. That's kind of the, I mean, it's the gold standard. It works. Is there a way to go above 4%? Yes, but you have to kind of be a little bit more flexible with your spending. Flexible. I've written a blog yeah. post on this that I can, if you want it, please DM me. I will send you the blog post that talks about how you can go above 4% and in, in different ways. Here's the truth though. Most people don't actually pull money from their portfolios. I talk about this in the book. Most, at least in the United States, they just live off their investment returns and they just spent like if their, if their income is a thousand you know, or $10,000 a month, they live off that or 5,000 a month, whatever it is, they live off of that. So they don't spend more than that. They say, Hey, this is my income. I spend that not more. So that's, that's what people tend to do. Even though there's all people talk about safe withdrawal rates and all this stuff doesn't really, most people don't do that. They just look at their income and they just say, that's what I spend. And so their principal basically just keeps growing over time. Generally. Uh, i will comment on that, uh, but I will first, mm -hmm. first translate. Uh, słuchajcie, generalnie Nick w, w książce opisuje to, patrzcie, już mi się język plącze po tym alkoholu. Uh, generalnie Nick w książce adresuje w pewnym sensie ten temat, pokazując uh, również to, że um, jak wyglądają fakty dotyczące wydatków osób starszych. I wbrew pozorom osoby starsze wydają mniej niż się spodziewają. I to jest jakby w książce są... Um, fakty i dane, które to potwierdzają po prostu, więc proponuję to przeczytać, ale oczywiście sama książka nie mówi o tym, jakie są strategie wypłacania pieniędzy na emeryturze, tak? Nie mówi o tym, jakie jest optymalne SWR i tak dalej. Nikt zaproponował, że jeżeli ktoś chce jakby wiedzieć, to wyślijcie mu wiadomość, podawał, że tak powiem, swoje namiary, a na Twitterze, jeżeli go zaczepicie albo na Instagramie go zaczepicie, to może wam wysłać link do artykułu, który, który SWR-a i takiej bezpiecznej stopy wypłaty z portfela 
dotyczy. Oczywiście, że tak powiem, dobra, już nie będę więcej rozwijał. I will comment from my side that SWR is typically treated as, I would say, mental check whether people are ready to to go for retirement or not. Uh, so uh, I, I would say that it is important mostly in the accumulation phase when uh, when you want to realize whether you are able to retire or not. But typically spending on the retirement is completely different story. <laughs> Very uh, true. Yeah. Uh, the, powiedziałem, że tak powiem, że z mojej perspektywy jest tak, że owszem, my się wszyscy tam w jakiś sposób zastanawiamy nad tym, czy jaka stopa wypłaty z portfela inwestycyjnego na emeryturze jest bezpieczna, w tym sensie, żeby portfel odrabiał to, co wypłacamy, ale z drugiej strony to jest taki bardziej bezpiecznik, który my próbujemy stosować w fazie akumulacji, żeby sobie uświadomić, czy już możemy przejść na emeryturę, niż rzeczywisty fakt, bo później jak przechodzimy na emeryturę, okazuje się, że tak naprawdę mniej pieniędzy potrzebujemy na życie, niż nam się pierwotnie wydawało i ten portfel w spokoju nam te koszty po prostu pokrywa, czy, czy przychody z tego portfela, zwłaszcza jeżeli jesteśmy inwestorem dywidendowym, tak? Mówiąc zupełnie wprost. Okej, okay, Nick. Um, <śmiech> Uh, let me check whether do we have another questions. Okay, uh, that question was already addressed. Uh, uh, Nick, how many books have you sold in the original version? So US version. Uh, yeah, 52,000. Okay, so most like of that. the sales is worldwide. And yeah, yeah. Let me number. let me look. I actually have this. Um, I'm tracking this. It's fifty. Yeah, fifty one two thirty five. So fifty fifty one thousand. Fifty one thousand. Nice. Yeah, that's just and that's just U.S. If you include the U.K., it's still English. I mean, do I include Indian English? If we include that, it's it's higher. It's like closer to probably seventy thousand, right? If we include the U.K. and India, which is in English, so I don't know. It depends how you define it. So. Okay, yeah. uh, we got it. And then uh, Fit Potato asks, uh, "Have you ever met in person?" No, no, like, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> actually, actually, we first met online last week when we was uh, recording. Uh, uh, when we were recording this uh, uh, this uh, talk for, for for this event. Uh, not yet, not yet, but we will sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for the questions. Uh, <laughs> those are crazy ones, you know. Nick, what would you, uh, in what will you invest tantiums from, from so um, revenue from the Polish edition? <laughs> what will I invest? Probably the same thing I would be investing with revenue from exactly. any edition. Any, exactly. I, I don't take the money from the Polish and buy Polish stocks or buy, like, no, there's no difference, so... <laughs> I wish I had a better, funnier answer. I don't. So crazy, crazy, crazy. People should I buy which me? Polish stock should I buy? Just tell me. I'll just <laughs> put, it, put it all into the Polish market. Uh, actually, I'm investing mostly in uh, U.S. stocks and um, you know, some European stocks too. So basically, okay, British okay. and um, and Netherlands, uh, but not not Polish stocks. I avoid Polish market, mm -hmm. uh, and I have some reasons for it. That's not for today's uh, meeting. Um, okay. Um, the question is, how popular in the US is the 401k um, a retirement system? How many per, uh, percent of US citizens are in? Do you have such Ooh, a number? Uh, I don't know that. There's got to be at least probably 70, 80 million people have a 401k. Or had mm -hmm. one, and they get. If you have one, and then roll it into IRA, and you don't have one anymore. I don't know. There's got to be, you know. So it's roughly twenty percent, probably, of of Americans. Oh no, more than that. Uh, sixty million. So sixty million of three hundred. So what is 60 that? Sixty million. Yeah, so I guess you're about. You're you're right. It is twenty percent. Wow. So yeah, you're yeah. right. I guess low yeah, number. Sorry. Quite low yeah. number. Honestly. Yeah, yeah. Sixty million. Um. Yeah. Did you realize? I mean, but do you include like? Okay, so if a if someone has a four one k. 
And like, does that mean their spouse, they're married? Does that not yeah. apply to the, the spouse and to the ch children? I mean, we're not counting that they have the 401k, but it's technically helping that family. So I don't know. It, it's weird. Like, it'll never be 300 million, 330 million people or whatever it is, you know, but you get the point. So mm -hmm. the question is, uh, uh, how young people, 18 to 30, um, in the USA, uh, how do they treat saving basically? Um, is it popular or uh, most of them really use credit cards and uh, use debt to finance their life? I think it's a mix. I mean, some mm -hmm. people, they're super cognizant of saving. Some people don't care and they just live their lives freely, but I, it's a mix. You're gonna get people from both sides. I don't think there's one or the other. I think it's you're going to get people across the spectrum. So to say, oh, it's all people just credit card, this, that, and people like credit card debt's actually kind of rare. There's not too many. If you actually look at the median, someone under 35, mm -hmm. you know what the median credit card debt is? Zero. The median, the middle person, right? There are people with credit card debt, but they're all on one side. The, the typical person doesn't have credit card debt. They have a credit card, but they pay it off every month, right? So the typical person in the US doesn't have credit card debt, right? But they also don't have a lot in investments either. So, you know, person yeah, under 35, yeah, it yeah so exactly exactly uh i mean so yeah, i will translate so większość uh, znaczy jeżeli spojrzy się na typowego że tak powiem amerykanina to nie ma długu na karcie kredytowej to są jakby ekstrema tak że ktoś znaczy ludzie korzystają z kart kredytowych ale spłacają swoje zadłużenie na bieżąco nie? czyli zadłużenie na kartach kredytowych więc mówimy raczej o jakichś ekstremach ale z drugiej strony też większość amerykanów po prostu nie ma pieniędzy czy tutaj no, wydaje to co zarabia nie? Uh, Nick, the question, have you been to Poland and what's your perception of our country from the financial mindset, mainly? So Actually, I, you had a presentation about Polish stock market. I, I, I not a, a presentation in particular, but I talked about it a little bit. I, I had a yeah, blog yeah. post where I talked about it. So I've never been to Poland. The closest I've been, I'm guessing. So I've been to Amsterdam. That's the closest. Yeah, I don't think I've even been anywhere. Yeah. I've never been more east than that yeah i'm trying to think italy I, i think italy is more to the west i can't i don't know where it is but like mm -hmm. no so i would say no i've not been i've been up to norway and other places but no norway nothing. norway is the yeah. closest one okay norway is the closest okay i didn't mm -hmm. realize that yeah so i've been to norway um that's the closest i've been but never been and then in terms of the my perception of the financial markets your guys financial markets my understanding were closed from the late 1800s until 19 the early 1990s you guys didn't even have a like financial market right exactly. so once that reopened i i just looked at the chart right so i don't know what it's like but i've seen there's a lot of speculation it's like up and down booms and bust 08 was really tough for you guys i mean at least on the stocks stocks got crushed but yes. apparently poland was the only country my understanding that didn't go through the recession which is like the only european country like that's i don't know what it was like there so i'm speaking you know, with no, with ignorance here, which is what I've read. But people said, yeah, Poland was the only country that avoided the recession. And it's like, how is that possible? But, you know, maybe you guys were, you, your economy was like diversified or moved away from whatever the core, the rest of the world was in. So you guys didn't get pulled into that. So we are know, very you, heavily tied to Germany in, in, yeah. uh, in terms of export. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, so that's that's thing. my perception. I've I've heard it's like a, there's been a lot of like speculative nature within investment markets because they haven't been around for a while. Um, but at the same time, like your economy seems like is done like decently well considering yes. all else considering. So that's that's my take on it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, the question is. Uh, okay, uh, the second version of the question. What investment strategy should I adopt if I want to try to invest in extra business? In example, temporary rental. Should all financial surpluses be used in this business or divided into proportions? <laughs> That's the question about your strategy, Adam. Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, the question is like, do you put all of your money into this one thing or should you divide it and be even more diversified? I, I guess it's what you're trying to get out of it. I mean, there's obviously risk of putting everything into one business and that business fails, right? So it's generally better to be diversified. But then at the same time, if you don't put enough money into something, it could just fail. If you're like, hey, I don't want to yeah. update the, let's say you have a rental. You're like, I don't want to update the kitchen. I don't want to update the pipes and the pipes, you know, the depreciation could eat you alive already. And if you would just 
paid those costs early, you won't get into trouble later. So it's really a, a question of risk. And it, I think it's come, it's too specific. Like you, you have to know the specifics to answer it. I, I wish I could give you a better answer, but like it all depends on the specifics. As they say in the United States, the devil is in the details. So you can translate it that as you see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, one more question. Oh, we have several questions. Machi asks, what is the difference between your investment philosophy and concepts concepts from the book and Bogleheads approach and mantra? Uh, Bogleheads, I think the main difference between me and the Bogleheads, um, the Bogleheads are, I mean, John Bogle was, didn't diversify outside of US stocks. He did not own international stocks. And his argument, which I think is a fair argument, is like, hey, US is operating all over the world. US stocks are operating. Exactly. Apple's and Apple's selling iPhones everywhere, right? Google has Google around the world for the most part, right? So it's like if you're owning US stocks, you have diversification. That's the argument, right? And it's not a bad argument. You look at how the US stock market is done. It's actually kind of a decent argument, but at the same time, I'm not of the opinion that like that 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 is the only thing that matters. I think there's other risk factors that U.S. stocks have that other um, that international markets don't have. So that's probably one big deviation. And, and there's a lot of people in the Bogleheads that own international stocks. So don't, I want to speak for all of them. Um, that's probably the biggest deviation, I would say, is our asset allocation. And I believe more in international than probably the typical Boglehead because John Bogle didn't believe in owning international stocks. Um, but still, I think I think Nick that Bogle Huts are uh, really div diversifying di diversifying worldwide. I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I would I would say a lot of the Bogleheads even differ because remember, like Jack Bogle is like the top Boglehead, right? So it's like yeah. people are even <laughs> okay. don't even agree with the person who started in some ways. And so I think there's a, a, a rift in in there. The only other thing, I mean, I'm probably more interested in trying to do things that are more that are less correlated. I think most Bogleheads would just do stocks and bonds, and that's the end of it. I own REITs. I one day plan to get into farmland. I will probably get into royalties. The problem is a lot of those things require a much bigger investment, and mm -hmm. I just don't have... I can't be dropping you know $50,000 on like the royalties to this one random song right now. I mean, maybe one day if, if, if things go well for me, I can be investing in that way. But I mean... That would be too much of my net worth to put into one specific thing. But if if my net worth were to grow significantly, then I would be able to invest in in things like that. So I am probably more open to other asset classes at the while well, the bull heads are basically stocks and bonds. So that's my only other approach. I think there's other asset classes out there that you should at least explore or consider. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, um, Arthur asks, um, Polish pension funds, PPK, invest mostly in Polish stocks. Uh, this is the pension program, um, government pension program for for all poles basically, uh, who are hired within the uh, uh, companies, um, which is good for Polish stock market, but bad for investors. What is more important, support local market or interest of investors? That's the good question. That is what a great think? question. Um, I don't know. This gets into like a. I'm trying to think, I'm trying to, let's say this was the, there's an equivalent in the U.S. that only invested in U.S. stocks. And that's kind of how a lot of 401ks are in some way. So mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know if I even agree with the premise. So, which is good for Polish stock market, but bad for investors. How is it bad for investors in the sense that you don't have as much diversification? Is that why it's uh, bad? I will tell you, I will tell you, Nick, yeah. because, um, mm, uh, one of the rules within PPK, it's, it's by the law. By the law, law defines mm -hmm. how what should be the construction of the por investment por portfolio in in this pension uh, program. So basically, the construction is that um, talking about the uh, equity part of the portfolio, forty percent, forty percent of it have to be invested in VIG twenty. So basically, top twenty Polish companies on the Polish market, uh, on the Polish stock exchange, uh, and. Uh, taking into consideration how big part is the whole Polish uh, stock uh, um, uh, exchange versus the global uh, capitalization of, of stock markets, uh, there is, I would say, a huge, huge, huge home bias, basically. And uh, the, on top of that, uh, eight of those uh, VIG-20 companies, so uh, eight of those companies are uh, a company is partially owned by by government 
and uh, um, some consider the PPK the the, the way of um, uh, putting uh, people's money into into the stock market, but mostly mostly into the companies owned by partially owned by government, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's a it's a question of like, do you support your country? It's like a nationalism question, I think. And it's like, definitely you're like, oh, well, that's only helping the government. Well, who's <laughs> the government? The government's in theory, like owned or run in by theory, the Polish yeah, people, yeah. right? So it's like every person is owning. So I don't know. I mean, I think it's probably especially if like there's companies that are struggling, it like helps keep them afloat. And it's probably better. It's better for your local economy as a Polish person to be doing that, but it's probably worse for your particular pocketbook. Portfolio returns. So yeah. I think and it probably risk, hedges risk. risk. Yeah. Like if you didn't if you had the freedom to just invest wherever and no one invested in Polish stocks, like you your your people you know, your day to day experience would be worse, but you would have possibly more money in your investment account, which is like weird. And so I don't know. It's it's a great question and I actually don't have a good answer for it. I mean, I don't know. It's you see, I don't know what what would you say? Uh, I have my opinion. I basically say that this uh, program is somehow flawed. So basically, uh, that's uh, up to you to decide. But uh, first of all, you have to have the data and decide on the facts and data. The problem is the, the data is somehow skewed because uh, uh, when you look at, uh, uh, for example, the information about what the real costs of invest investing in these pension, uh, pension funds are, uh, uh, you will hear that they are low, but uh, if you look at the data, they are quite high. Uh, so basically, there is some kind of misinformation or, let's say, propaganda uh, uh, about those pension programs here in Poland. And um, I, I say to people, okay, I will give you the... I already gave the explanation within the book. I mean, in chapter 19, you have the explanation what I would do basically, and what the real costs are, but decision is up to every person. So basically, you can, of course, you can, uh, you can support the, the local market, but uh, talking about whether these pension, Polish pension funds follow the just keep buying rules, I would say they don't follow them because they lack the diversification. Uh, and uh, so basically, if you want to invest according to the strategy, to to Poprostu Kupoi strategy or just keep buying strategy, uh, which is also the investment into the uh, active classes that not only produce the income but are well diversified, then this program does not fit that requirement basically. And this is the this is my uh, my thought about that, and I put uh, this thought into the book. And of course, it's up to the people to decide. Yeah. Yeah, no, I see. I think there's a there's this balance between what's good for you as an investor, which I agree exactly. with. You're completely exactly. right. Versus exactly. like, well, this well, the government's obviously doing stuff to help their own people, and so I think there there is something to that to think that oh, that doesn't matter. I think that's not correct. I think people do care. I mean, you have to as a Polish person, you have to people care about should the people have a Poland. choice. I would say. The yeah, choice. I, yeah, but, I agree. And then, but how do you do? Because everyone had a choice, and everyone's like, "Well, I'm just gonna do what's best for me." That could actually hurt the. That could harm the collective good. So I, I don't know. I'm kind of torn on it. You know, like if the U.S. had a program that said you could only invest in U.S. companies, but everyone has home bias. So, like by the definition, by having an investment market, you're going to be doing. Even though the the U.S. doesn't force you to buy U.S. stocks, but guess what? CNBC promotes it. everyone talks about U.S. stocks and only yeah, U.S. stocks. Yeah, yeah. So guess what? We end up owning mostly U.S. stocks. So we do it by proxy. We're doing the same thing that the PPK is doing without actually no one's forcing us. But like how many people own international stocks? It's only it's low. It's like 20 to 30 percent of investors. Most investors don't own international stocks. Most yeah, people don't even the, invest, but even those that do. Yeah. Nick, but the difference is that uh I would say S and P 500 stocks are well well diversified globally. Yes, that is true. Yeah. So basically, sector sector wise, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So your home bias, I mean, American home bias, is more, yeah, more diversified. Definitely, way more diversified than a Polish home bias. I would mm. say. Yeah. So that's true. That's most European difference. companies, like. You know, yeah. the UK, it's like all telecom companies, right? Exactly. I know Germany's exactly. got some car companies, some manufacturers, right? It's like every every place has their has what they do, but the US happens to have a lot more diversity. And so I, I hear that. That's a fair counter. I like that. Yeah. 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 
Okay, very good question. Very good question. So thank you very much for the question. Uh, Nick, please say thank you in Polish. Oh, <laughs> dziękuję. <laughs> <laughs> Dziękujemy dokładnie. Dziękuję. Dziękuję, dziękuję. Okay, uh, there is a question about uh, proportions in, in your portfolio. So basically, what are uh, the, the percentages of uh, emerging markets versus rates uh, versus uh, developed markets and everything else? So he wants to know what my breakdown or what is, I'm sorry. Yeah, breakdown, breakdown of your uh, portfolio. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I would say it's like 40%. Okay, I'm trying to do the whole portfolio. So let's just do income producing assets. So of the yeah. 90% of my portfolio, yeah. So let's just look at that as a bucket. It's like 40% US stocks. Um, mm -hmm. It's probably 30% international, which is 50-50 emerging and developed. So let's say 15% okay. emerging market, 15% uh, developed market, uh, X US. 10% REITs, and then 40%. Yeah, so that's about 80. Yeah, it's about right. And then the other 10% is um, income, which is like the bond piece, right? So that's going to be my treasury bills. And then there's 10% in Bitcoin, art, my private companies, whatever, all these other things. So yeah, for the most yeah, part, yeah. that 90% is 40% US uh, or maybe even 30. It might even be 35. I've changed it. I usually keep the US and the international pretty similar. So like if the US is 35%, then international is 35. And then I have 10 in REITs, right? So like, yeah. And that remember that 35 in internationals, half is emerging market, half um, is uh, developed. So developed. That's yeah. and it's it's that's roughly a market cap weighted idealization of the world. Um, is it right? No, nothing. I, there's no even when you have the right portfolio, you're going to lose money sometimes, and and it's tough. I've had things like I've had gold in there, and I took gold in and out, but I don't do gold anymore. I don't do commodities or anything like that. I don't do managed futures, even though there's like there's evidence that some of that stuff works. I just don't. I don't think it's necessary. I mean, what's going to really change my life is like the work product I produce, the type of stuff. Like my career is more important than my investment portfolio, at least right now. In 20, 30 years from now, come talk to me. But for now, it's all about my career, if I'm being honest. And that's that's what Just Keep Buying talks about. So, Exactly. 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 Uh, great to hear that. Thank you very much for the answer. And uh, ch -ch 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 Nick, do you have children? The question is. Not yet. Uh, one, Not one yet. day, my my girlfriend's <laughs> cooking right now, so I mean, we can go ask her that. No, so I'm okay. 33 right now, but uh, yeah, we've been dating for a few years, so w one day, <laughs> <laughs> one day. What was your worst financial decision? Worst investment? I've had a few. I've debated. So I bought some. I bought some tech stocks in late 2021. In early 2022, I bought some altcoins. Like I remember, I put a very, very small percentage, not even 1% of my entire portfolio. So a small amount of money relatively. Um, and all these things blew up. Those were bad. I think the worst ones, though, were the private invest. I, it's hard to say, like, what is your worst? At one point, I said my worst investment was Bitcoin, right? Because I bought Bitcoin at like, I think, 8,000. And then it went down at one point to like 4,000. And I wrote it was the worst investment. And I, I didn't sell it yet, though, right? I didn't sell it. I said it was the worst investment I ever made. And then Bitcoin went up above. I oh, sold yeah, it definitely. at 52,000 or half of it at least. And it became my best investment. So like right now I can be like, what's technically my worst investment? It's my private companies that I put a little bit of money into and they all went to zero, right? And so it's like, right as of now, right now, right those are my now. worst investments, but technically they haven't gone to, like the, the companies haven't gone bankrupt yet. So one day they might, you know, uh, exit and I get a huge and I'm like holy crap I, I look back but I have three of them I have three private companies that's probably my worst investment but we'll see only time will tell so I would put all of them actually the, my, my answer is all all the speculative investments are my worst all of them together I'm putting them all together in one thing because it, I'm, I'm judging them based on the outcome and I shouldn't I never even if I end up even if my private companies end up going 100x it's still a bad investment because it's too risky it's not what I believe in and so I would still say it's a bad investment even if I end up making a ton of money on it so that's my that's yeah. my take. Yeah. Okay. A few more questions, and we'll wrap up definitely. And uh, uh, this is this is a, a tricky one. And um, I would, yeah, you can read it. You talked about the asset classes you have. You probably have a different allocation that you set individually. Is this already an active strategy? And I would uh, I would like to add something to this or explain this. Uh, Do you have any uh, scenario 
for changing the asset classes allocations in, in your portfolio, Nick? Do you do? Yeah, so to, can to... you can you can you give it the criteria for such an eventual situation? For example, that for example, you will realize that you want to limit the emerging markets allocation. Is there any case for that or or not? I mean, there's you have to like make. We can start getting to very specific. Like, if you think that there's been a fundament, a massive fundamental change in how uh, capital markets work in some of these areas. Like, I don't think, for example. Will, I will add one thing. For example, bonds yes, yes. right now. I mean, the the situation of bonds, for example. Yeah, you don't you don't have you said you don't have. Uh, um long-term bonds in your portfolio is there a, a situation you would like to have them in the portfolio or not if rates got high enough yeah that's so like yeah. bonds are bonds are the easy answer that's the easy one to answer yeah. because it's literally it's just our, a number like if bonds yeah. start paying i mean in the early 1980s bonds were paying you know 10 percent plus they start getting to double digits I will consider buying bonds and there's actually jim o'shaughnessy is a famous us investor wrote what works on wall street the only mm -hmm. time he's basically all equities or, or, or income producing high risk assets. The only time he purchased bonds in his entire life was in the early 80s when rates were that high. And that's the same thing. I'm not like him at long term bonds, at least. Right. I will own treasuries. I'm not as risk. He's a much bigger risk taker than I am. And even though he's even older than me, he still takes a lot more risk than me, which is says something. But I would not ever buy a long date, long dated bond unless the rates got high enough where I was like, this is actually a deal, you know, but, it, but the problem is in those times when the rates are that high, things aren't looking good. No one's like, oh my God, things are great. When rates are that high, things aren't, are looking bad. And so there's, there's a lot of reasons why people may not buy bonds at that, at that level. So that's my take. I think the harder question is the equity or the risk asset question. Like, for example, I yeah. used to own gold. What made me stop owning gold? I looked at some historical data and it has a 20 year real drawdown. Like the whole, like there's 20, exactly. you imagine buying something for 20 years and for 20 years, it is still, it doesn't go up basically. It's like, it would be crazy. Right. And so I'm not saying, could the U S experience that? Yes, it could. I mean, could any individual markets experience that all the time? Look at Greece since 08, Greece since 08. It's, that when will it eclipse that? Japan's a great example, right? But yeah, I think that's different in an equity market because equity markets go through this and they, they have periods and we have data that they go through this, right? So I am a broadly owned, you know, I'm diversified across all these markets and some of them won't do as well. And I'm not going to give up and say sell out of this country. No, nothing like that. I think there have to be a major change in how, you know, like for example, emerging markets work with capital markets in some way for me to say, don't own emerging markets. And I, my, my yeah. thesis is like, these things will create wealth over time and we just have to wait. And right now it's just, the US happens to be doing better. I don't think that's gonna be true forever and we have to wait and see. So I could be wrong, but that's, I mean, I'm, I'm actually going to be wrong. If I don't, then I would have the perfect portfolio. I know I don't have it. So I'm going to be wrong on something. I have to accept that and kind of go from there. So I hope that's a good answer exactly. for people. Exactly, exactly, very good answer. Uh, so. Uh, I would add one thing that uh, I already said uh, during our uh, uh, interview. Uh, if you want to have the diversified portfolio, there will always be the asset classes which are performing better and which are performing worse. That's the way it is, basically. So yep. yeah, I fully, I fully on agree. This next Tuesday. It's my two my Tuesday post called the downsides of diversification. I'm talking about that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Okie dokie. So we know what will your next post post will be. Um, I'm looking for the questions. We'll take two more and we'll finish. Um, uh, just comment. Uh, great stream. Thank you for those working behind the scenes and Nick and Michal. It seems like the book is very useful to get together with fin Finance of a Ninja should be an obligatory lecture in a high school. I fully agree. Thank you. Thank you. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> obligatory, mm. yes. Yes, obligatory. For, for both Polish and US schools. <laughs> yes, high schools, yes. <laughs> Uh, we'll be doing. We'll do the next. If that happened, we do the next uh, live stream from our yacht. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> that, definitely. Well, actually, we can do it right now. I mean, I, I mean, there is no problem in renting the yacht for two hours, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. That's that's technically true. So uh, okay, okay, okay. But we don't want to do that. Uh, yes, no. I really don't like to show off uh, too much. So uh, this is nice last question, I would say, Nick. 
when do you plan to start your retirement? At which age? I would say, I would add in which conditions and what are your plans for the time? I've this, some, this is kind of related to a question that was asked earlier and I just don't, I don't know the answer. I don't yeah. know. I don't know the answer to that. I think every person's different. And for me right now, like I can't, I mean, I can't imagine myself not working. Like I, even when I go on like a two week vacation, by the end of the two weeks, I'm starting to get antsy. I feel like I want to write, I need to do something. And so I can't imagine myself just sitting on a beach the rest of my, like, I think that would honestly be torture. Me never producing anything, writing anything. And so it's not even about the money. It's just like, I need that outlet. I'm assuming, you know, you're the same and like, you need to do something. And so at some point, maybe I'll, I'll want to spend more time with family and not want to do that. Maybe I'll, I'll blog less or I won't blog at all. And maybe I'll write a book once in a while. I don't know. It's just tough to know right now. I mean, the thick of it, I'm going, I'm pushing forward. I have ideas for other books. Like I'm in that space in my life right now. And so for me, I can't imagine like, um, you know, stopping that anytime soon. And I can't even, it's, it's just, it's a tough question to, to answer. Cause I just have no clue. Like the world could change. I mean, for all I know, I get hit with some rare, you know, God forbid I hit with some crazy disease or something. And like, that's, and that's going to change my life. And that would, you know, every, every little thing can change your trajectory and I'd have no idea how it's going to pan out. And so that's the, that's the honest truth. Uh, you have suggestion from the older one. I mean, I know uh, uh, Krzysztof. Krzysztof is the guy. And he said, uh, Nick, start windsurfing. Don't sit on the beach. And <laughs> it, it can take a lot of time for you. <laughs> okay, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, honestly, uh, looking from my perspective, I'm 50 years old right now. And uh, I would say I'm partially, partially retired. Basically, I can retire at my, any moment uh, because... Uh, I already have a portfolio that is financing my life. Um, so I would say I like the satisfaction that comes with effects of work, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really hard to stop working uh, because when you do something that you consider important for you and important for other people, yeah, it's. Uh, I would say I, I consider stopping working as the waste of resources, and I I have to. Um, I mean, waste of my resources. So basically, I have to somehow deal with that feeling that uh, I'm wasting those resources. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's a process. It's uh, it lasts. Uh, it started fewer few years ago when I realized that I can retire, and basically, I'm trying to find my way and. Uh, just keep buying as the book and Poprost to Kupo with the Polish edition is is um, is quite important because it also um, uh, it also deals with uh, this fire movement. I mean, financial independence, retire early, and you ask very good questions there. Basically, yeah, you you ask whether you have any idea of what will you do when you retire retire and you give examples of people that are unhappy they are nomads uh, traveling around the world uh, they are living the life that was expected to be the best life uh, you can have and they are unhappy basically yeah so the question is okay what makes you happy yeah and uh, i think that for most of the people most of the people realize that uh, that's exactly what they are doing most of their lives yeah they are working and they get their satisfaction from uh, the results of their work basically yeah well, that's one part of course there is family uh, there are friends and so on and so on nobody says that the, you have to only work but still uh if you stop working the question is what will fill that empty space yeah yeah i completely agree could not say it yeah. better okay know. let's wrap up then and um, mm, i will say a few words in polish słuchajcie bardzo wam dziękuję za uczestnictwo dzisiaj e, w ogóle bardzo wam dziękuję za to że kupowaliście tą książkę bo rezultat jest niesamowity może na koniec rzeczywiście jeszcze raz pokażę liczby e, ale to jest kawał cegły którą naprawdę polecam e, jestem z bardzo w ogóle jestem bardzo dumny z tego że to wyszło e, że wyszło po polsku, że miałem w tym swój udział e, i przetłumaczę to teraz dla Nika. Nick, I'm very, very uh, grateful for 
uh, people that bought the book so far. And um, I said I'm proud, really, about this Polish adaptation because uh, it's good, basically. And uh, as far as I don't, as far as I hate saying good words about my work, <laughs> I really, I'm really happy that uh, that this book. Uh, uh, shipped in Poland and is uh, that was uh, really um, that it it's full of my comments and uh, the chapter 19 was uh, rewritten by me so I'm really really happy because this is the book that Polish people should read basically yeah so it's your wisdom plus uh, I would say my corrections to the Polish editions uh, Polish edition and I'm really really happy that you trusted me uh with the process and uh i'm happy that i was able to deliver basically so <laughs> that's it that's it thank you very much nick oh no thank you i just want to say thank you you've put in so much time and effort into this like between obviously writing the book that takes a ton of time and effort signing them you took you did uh i did the math that you did one book every six seconds right so it takes about 17 <laughs> hours of signing okay one you book every six guy. seconds yeah. crazy just Really, I just I can't say thank you enough. I, I no one's put even a tenth or a hundredth this much effort as you put into this. So thank you, truly, truly. You know, Chinkuya, I, I appreciate it so much. You know, my, through my broken Polish. Um, yeah, <laughs> okay. I, I really appreciate it, and I look forward to, to meeting you one day. And so thank you to everyone who bought the book. Definitely, thank you for coming out. I can try and read this translation. You know, Chinkuya. Please do. Za, Please do. Yeah. Okay. So you already try. Okay. Let's try this. Uh, dziękuję za zaufanie e kupna szoszki. Uh, that's like my thank you for purchasing my book. Is that how close is that? I don't know. Okay, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Dziękuję za zaufanie i kupno książki. It's okay. It's yeah, okay. it was close enough. Dziękuję za zaufanie i kupna szoszki. That's that's it. So um, and uh, the brown of shishkim. The brown of shishkim. Dziękuję. Dobranot wszystkim, moi drodzy. Dobranot wszystkim. Dziękujemy ślicznie za to spotkanie. Trzymajcie się. Uh, to jest koniec tego streama uh, i świętujemy wszyscy, którzy mogą kieliszek dla was. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Gamiel.